This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Are these stocks under-owned by institutional Wall Street? A lot of these companies talking about generative AI. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Investors just worried about the ongoing sales slump in China. And Michael Barr with news. A ship traveling through the Southern Red Sea has been attacked. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Help me, Paul. I remember how to do this. I took an Uber today. I guess it didn't work no, out. No, it didn't Look work for the quarter. Uber. Stock down 10% pre-market trading. Second quarter bookings outlook midpoint misses estimates. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think people are <clears throat> using Ubers as much more than they ever have. I don't get it. I don't get it either. I look at the fee they're charging. Well, if they, if, here's the arch question as we start the show this morning. If they raise a the price of a given Uber, Uber four or five dollars, well, would anybody say no? no I'm not going to take it. I'm going to take a cab or you know no. this that and the other. No, I don't think so. I no. just don't. I just don't get it. But Good morning. I, but what I do is I arbitrage it. I go Uber and Lyft, and I take the lowest price. Matt Miller does not do that. He just goes Uber. He has brand loyalty. I don't have any brand loyalty. I just picked yeah. Lyft, Uber, what, and I did that this morning. Whichever one has a cheaper one, I go. There you go. I took Lyft this morning. Good morning. The, car, the Bentley was in the garage. Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. We're trying to remember how to do this after a few days off. We welcome all of you. Huge economics today. And, of course, the equity markets front and center. As I mentioned, Brian Belsky with BMO with us. He's a bull. He'll be with us in the 9 o'clock hour. Emily Rowland from the John Hancock Company, Boston, Massachusetts. And the vice chairman thrilled that Richard Clarida will darken the door in the 9 o'clock hour uh, this morning. John Tucker is going to help out here with the uh, data checks here in the Bloomberg Business Flash in a moment. We're in the Interactive Broker Studios on Apple CarPlay, on YouTube, Bloomberg Podcast. Paul, yep. I got the statistics from Google. Okay. Emily Chang interviewed the CEO. She said, Tom Keen needs the statistics. See, we need so to see him. Thank yep. you, Google, for sending me uh, the mathematics on YouTube. And I'm just beyond humbled, folks. I can't tell you that the amount of time spent listening for me and Paul is, and the team is just sobering. We know it's because of Michael Barr. I of mean, course. You know, it's yeah. really the reason it's... It's happening. Anyways, in the Interactive Broker Studios with our Bloomberg Business Flash, John Tucker. All right. After the uh, parade of earnings continuing, we have uh, futures right now indicating a lower cash open on Wall Street. Let's go back to Uber Technologies all over the place right now. Down 6.3%. Uh, first quarter gross bookings, as you uh, mentioned, missing estimates. We did get lift after the close of regular trading of those shares in the pre-market. They're up uh, right now almost 5%. Also coming across the, uh, the tape right now, Shopify, the first quarter of revenue 1.86 billion and that beat estimates there uh, overall again as we say the s p futures they are down five points right now that's down a tenth of a percent the nasdaq futures 22 points lower the dow futures right now they are unchanged uh looking at europe european stocks extending their gains this morning, rising to a fresh record. The FTSE in London up 29 points right now. That's a rise of four-tenths of a percent. The Europe Stock 600 up four-tenths of a percent. And as we look at Treasuries right now, the benchmark 10-year yield up two basis points. This is at 447. The two-year yield, which is more policy reactive, unchanged at 483. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Welcome back, Tom. Uh, John Tucker, thank you, thank you, thank you. With us now, let's get started, jump in in the bond market, in clipping coupons or total return. Kathy Jones joins us from Charles Schwab. Let's start with first principles. Are we clipping a coupon forward, or is it going to be about actual total return? I think there will be opportunities, there are opportunities for total return in addition to clipping the coupon. Uh, coupon's not bad when you're in <laughs> the five good. and a half, six percent area. Um, but I think there will be some opportunities for capital gain as well and, and getting that total return. So Kathy, do I sit there? I mean, I'm looking at my screen right here. I can get a two-year treasury, 4.83%, you know, close to 5%. Is, I mean, is that the trade or should I take some credit risk and go out and think about some of the credit returns I can get. 
Yeah, we've liked investment grade corporates for for quite a while now. The spread versus treasuries uh, is very low. Right. Uh, but that reflects a good equity market, a resilient economy, and a lot of confidence in uh, the ability of companies, the bigger companies, to you know, have the cash flow to pay their shareholders. So I, I'm not too concerned about that. I, I think the opportunity going forward in corporates is not as great as it has been because that spread probably tight, can't yeah. tighten as much. But again, you're talking all in yields yeah. that are very, very attractive. I, I look at chart. You know, what I do, folks, is I really steal from everybody I can, including <laughs> Kathy Jones and Lizanne Saunders. And somebody gave me yield to worst, the global yield to worst index. And it's basically back to where it was in 2000, higher yields, obviously. If it's price up, yield down, are we still in a bond bear market? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that we're in a bond bear market, but I also don't know that we're in a bull market at this stage of the game. I think that I agree with that. We're going Continue. sideways. You know, I think we're going sideways here for a while. Um, but I think that gives us a lot of trading opportunities, and that's where that total return comes in. If you're an active manager, this is a really nice environment. Yeah, but what about a slug retiree? I mean, I mean, Sweeney's on his desk with a laptop opening trading leveraged ETFs <laughs> in the bond market. If we're not trading, what do we do here? And the answer is you buy the coupon. Yeah, yeah, and the coupons, the coupon's great right now. We haven't seen coupons like this in, what, 15 years yep. or so. So if, you know, for an everyday investor, you either buy a bond fund with with a nice, you know, yield to, to uh, worst, I guess, on the underlying, or you go and buy some individual bonds and, uh, you know, lock in those cash flows. So, Kathy, I'm looking at, I'm looking at my Bloomberg terminal, INGO. That gives me the Bloomberg Index Browser. Shows me how the credit markets are, fixed income markets are, are performing around the world. The only green I see in the U.S. is high yield year to date. And last year, the only green was high yield. I mean, it looks like the market's happy to take some serious credit risk out there, despite calls about maybe a recession or something like that. What's going on in the high yield market? It's the coupon. It's the power okay. of the coupon. Um, you know, you're getting those yields that are seven percentish or so, maybe a little bit higher, and that can that can be offsetting any price decline that might come in. And you also see the tightening spread. And I think that, you know, just as the equity market is doing well because there's a risk appetite out there, you're seeing people go into high yield because there's a risk appetite. The other thing is what we've seen in some of the market is either private debt taking some of these, uh, before you get a default and a full bankruptcy, you're seeing kind of the private credit folks step in. Mm -hmm. So you're not seeing the default rate move up as much as it might. Paul, otherwise. you've been way out, a victory lap for Paul Sweeney on this. You've been way business. out front on this. And in Business Insider published last night, was not a devastating, I don't want to editorialize, but a lengthy article on the private debt of the Blackstone real estate yeah, investment. Yeah, extraordinary. Trust. Yeah. And, and just, I, I just want to say to everybody, Sweeney's been like <laughs> two years ahead on this. Love the private credit business. I should be uh, doing that now if I came onto the street. So again, are there sectors that you like here versus that maybe your team is not focused on? What are some of the sectors you like here in maybe investment grade or even high yield? Yeah, um, we have. We actually simply want to make sure that we're in a diversified enough portfolio when you come to the corporate market. Um, you know, consumer discretionary may be a little less positive than some of the others. Materials look okay mm. to us, but in general, um, just having make, making sure you have enough diversification within the portfolio is important as well. I think it's like my chart of the year here. I've got. I'm going to explain a chart on radio, folks. That really works out. I'm going to take this yield to worst chart. I take it back to Paul to 1990, rather, not Ooh. Paul Volcker. And I've got the great moderation, total return, Bill Gross, price up, yield down. Everything's great. I'm out six and a half standard deviations. The yield has exploded higher. It's like a medical chart. It's not like a finance chart as well. Now, you said we're in a trading range around here. I'll take you on that, it's been a year or two. Do you have any vision of a return to the great moderation if real yields come in or the Fed comes to the rescue? Yeah, I think that we can get lower yields from here and, and not not back at the you know financial crisis lows or the pandemic lows by any means, but we can get lower yields here. I'm not sure that we're in a world where 
um, we're going to see this, uh, this return of excessive inflation or a big risk premium for inflation as it has gradually moderated and right. looks like it's going to continue to. What a great brief. <laughs> Kathy Jones, thank you so much. With Charles Schwab, uh, I'm thrilled to have her in here. With where's the Sweeney yield? Like the two year, the two, I, I, I'm relearning the screen, folks. 4.84% on the two year yield. That's down nicely from the 5% uh, level. With our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, and John. Federal Judge Eileen Cannon in Florida presiding over Trump's classified documents prosecution has canceled the May 20th trial date, postponing it indefinitely. Loyola Law Professor Jessica Levinson spoke to CBS. She said there's just a lot of evidentiary issues to sort out. And she is pointing to the fact that we're talking about some concerns about national security. And that does raise additional questions for any judge when they're overseeing a trial like this. Former President Trump faces dozens of felony counts accusing him of illegally hoarding classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida. Trump took them with him after he left the White House in 2021 and then obstructed the FBI's efforts to get them back, according to prosecutors. He has pleaded not guilty and denied wrongdoing. Porn star Stormy Daniels testified yesterday at former President Trump's New York hush money trial about a sexual encounter she says they had in 2006. Daniel says the encounter led to her being paid off to stay silent during the 2016 presidential election. Testimony resumes tomorrow. The U.S. paused a shipment of bombs to Israel over concerns that Israel was approaching a decision on launching a full-scale assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafa against the wishes of the U.S. More than a million civilians are sheltering in Rafa. Far-right Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene says the ball is in House Speaker Mike Johnson's court after two days of meetings between the pair over her push to have him removed. Greene says she wants the Speaker to commit to several actions. They include no additional funding for Ukraine. What I'm trying to do is, is give Mike Johnson a chance to be a Republican Speaker, and he seems willing to try to do that. Speaker Johnson told reporters he and Green are still talking through ideas but stressed this is not a negotiation and that he will still continue to do his job. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. Hey, Michael Barr, thanks so much. Parachuting in from Milken Institute, Hugh Von Steenis with Ooh. Oliver Wyman, Wyman out there educating people, informing yeah. people. And Paul, he just says there's no other topic out there. And you know, I, I guess I get that with L.A. because if I'm in private credit <laughs> or equity, Hollywood's the best place to go right now. Yeah. It's too invented. But he just says there's no other topic. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, it, you, know, you think about private credit and just the extraordinary growth in the capital there, the funds flow there. And again, again, from the, what the experts tell us is, you know, the great financial crisis, 2008, uh, the banks are slapped with a bunch of uh, regulatory constraints on some of the type of lending they could do and it limited that. And so mostly yeah. on the leveraged loan business. And then so the private credit yeah. folks stepped in. And just like we grew up with private equity, now we've got private you know, credit. I was on the cruise liner and, you know, I was, I was out of touch. You didn't tell me about Disney. Mm -mm. I mean, you know, the, I noticed in the report, theme parks was barely mentioned. I mean, it's well, theme parks. Else. It's you know, t theme parks are seventy seven zero percent of their operating income. Um, and seventy percent yes, of the company. Yeah, and that's not necessarily. I mean, it's a good thing because it's a great business, but it means a lot of their other businesses have declined dramatically. Think ESPN, um, and so that's increased the importance of the theme park business, and they benefited from the you know the post pandemic surge in travel, well, we gotta, and they're saying that might be just yeah. kind of plateauing a little bit. I don't go to ESPN like I used to. we got to talk about that. Yeah. I, you know, it used to be like you, you went there like religion. Futures at negative nine to VIX, 13.29 from New York City. Paul Sweeney, Tom Keen, Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker, the Bloomberg Newsroom, with this Bloomberg Business Flash being brought to you by BNY, a BNY Mellon Insight, June 4th to the 6th in Nashville, Tennessee. Don't miss the essential event for the financial advice community. Visit insight.bnymellon.com. Uh, stock futures, they have turned lower after the latest batch of earnings this morning. Shares of Uber, they are among the most active Uber technologies right now, down 6.6% after the second quarter bookings. They missed estimates on another front. Shares of Apple up about a two-tenths of a percent pre-market trading. Chinese iPhone shipments, they jumped 12% in March. And European stocks extending their gains this morning, rising to a fresh record. Uh, Dow futures right now, 13 points lower. S&P E-mini futures down about 8 points. And the Nasdaq futures, 32 points lower. FTSE in London, 26 points higher. That is up 3 tenths of a percent. Europe stocks uh, 600 index, that is up 3 tenths of a percent. Two-year yields at 483. That's uh, relatively unchanged. The 10-year yield right now up two basis points. That's at 448. And we check the markets for you all day long. Right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Paul and Tom. Uh, thanks so much, John uh, Tucker. Good morning, everyone. On Apple CarPlay and Android Play on YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcasts. And you will find us. We've got the show on live. Good morning to you. I'm still not on live chat. I'll get on live chat here in a moment. Love that. Uh, but also the replay comes out, Paul. This is, you know, it's nascent. Yep. I guess is how I put it. But it's important. It. We've got, we got a three-hour broadcast, two hours, 56 minutes. And there will be a lot of good things on there today, like Janet Henry joining us from HSBC. Thanks. The only one I hate more than Janet Henry is James Pomeroy. Why is that? Let's explain that right now. Good morning, Janet. And the reason is HSBC is one of the most twisted houses of research in the world. They argue like cats and dogs. Steve Major over in Hong Kong, Janet Henry over in England, everybody's in it. And it makes for, in this case, 29 pages of must read. You get, Paul, you get a pencil out, the surveillance yep. pencil, yep. and you read the HSBC Global Economics over Overview, waiting for the main act. You hate them because you got to read every page. Janet, with that introduction, what is the major message where you and Steve Major actually may agree on the view forward? Well, um, you'd be amazed, Tom. We do all get on remarkably well. We have great debates. Um, but also, you know, in terms of our asset allocation views um, from Steve, you know, they, they've been um, forecasting, um, you know, higher yields than they were, for instance, um, a couple of years ago. But I think in terms of, you know, the direction of travel um, as his forecast over the last year has been to forecast um, higher yields than he was previously. And, yeah, I think where we've been taken by surprise and certainly what I wrote about um, in that report and even what I wrote in my year ahead report, remember when the markets were really excited that we were going to be getting six rate cuts and we'd be cut yeah. in March. We said then, no, it would be June. Um, but suddenly we became the optimists in the room to suggest that rate cuts would be in June. Uh, we still think the Bank of England and the ECB will be cutting in June. Um, but for the Fed, um, we now think it will be um, September. So how does Christine, I, I'm going to rip up the script here, folks. I'm, <laughs> Clarida's coming out. we got to get warmed up for Richard Clarida. Janet Henry, how does Christine Lagarde get out front of Jerome Powell? Um, I think because they are telling us. I mean, but you're, I, I think the question is not whether they can cut before the Fed. Um, it's how much they can cut um, before the Fed. Uh, the, you know, the, the disinflationary pressures um, are different. Um, in Europe and, and not just the ECB, you know, the Bank of England arguably as well. We still think the Bank of England and the ECB will cut um, in June. Um, they've got weaker growth um, in Europe, even if it's on a slightly improving trend. Um, inflation is already lower. All importantly, service sector inflation is lower. Um, you know, yes, costs are higher. You, the Eurozone does not have the US productivity story. Um, and it has higher wage growth currently than the US. So it's not about the unit labor costs, it's about the different demand pictures and what that is meaning for inflation and, and the ECB, almost irrespective of the data. Um, currently, um, they told us they're going in June. Janet, uh, just give us a snapshot of kind of the inflation picture in the UK and in Europe today. Well, 
you know, when we think about, you know, what drives inflation, it's have you got the appropriate monetary policy setting to ensure that um, aggregate demand and aggregate supply um, achieve an inflation rate that's, you know, at least in the direction of going back towards target. And that's what they're trying to assess. What is the appropriate um, policy setting? And I think for all of the major central banks, the story for most of the last couple of years was obviously, you know, inflation was way too high. Yep. And when, when the ECB and the, um, the and even the Bank of England is much more about what's happening to inflation rather than like the Fed, which has an explicit dual mandate of, of what's happening to inflation and what is happening to um, to the labour market. So I think the, the, the difference between the two is, yeah, weaker demand um, means weaker um, inflationary pressures. We have seen Eurozone wage growth slow now, almost as low as the US, but not as much, but it is at least um, slowing down and has been for some time. Um, in the UK, annual wage growth is still a lot higher, but the recent momentum on the wage growth has been um, somewhat um, somewhat lower. So, so the difference is the difference in the demand pressures, um, wage growth is slowing um, in all of them, but the difference on inflation is not so much about the cost side, it's the demand pressures from inflation in the US um, are stronger, demand is a lot weaker yeah. um, in, in the US, in the UK and in the Eurozone. Janet, uh, for our listeners and our viewers, HSBC stands for Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. So we got to ask you for your kind of the HSBC house call on China. I have no idea how to handicap that. How are you guys thinking about it? Uh, well, like a lot of things in the global economy, it's very, very complicated um, what, what is happening in China. Uh, and actually, since the start of this year, in terms of the global cycle, you know, we have seen some green shoots. Um, but, you know, like everything, it's a little bit bumpy at the moment. And certainly within China, the areas of improvement have been very much concentrated in high tech investment, which has obviously been the global story. Even in Europe, where investment's been weaker, it's been in the high tech area where you've seen the strength. That is the same in China, um, high tech related investment, um, you know, partly private sector, but a lot of it in terms of the government's drive for greater of self-sufficiency in certain areas, tech-related areas. But as has been quickly reported, the major headwinds in China are still the right. ongoing drought for the property sector. And that is vital to getting any stabilization, a broader stabilization in consumer confidence and consumer right. spending, which at the moment is, is really only in services. We need to get a stronger consumer recovery. Jen, i got to squeeze this in. It's too important. When you were a club cadet, at HSBC, you ran the Pacific Rim shop. You're the economist for all the Pacific Rim for HSBC. Can Japan destabilize the Pacific Rim if they get the calculus on intervention or on yen dynamics or rate dynamics wrong? Um, it certainly can have implications um, for, for the currency, as you well know, um, Tom. You know, I, you're right. I started life with HSBC as an Asian economist. I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't responsible for Japan. I was the ASEAN economist during the Asian crisis. Um, so, but I would say, yes, I mean, there's lots of ways in which Japan can impact the global economy. Even if things go well in Japan, it has a really sustained recovery and interest rates rise a lot more than we are forecasting. You know, we've only got rates rising to 0.75 in Japan by the end of next year. If we were, for instance, in a 2% world or something that has implications for the global cost of capital. On the currency, we've been surprised, uh, it, our currency strategists have by the extent of weakness um, in Japan. Japan. They still look for the yen to strengthen a little bit by the end of the year because we have got a rate rise in Japan, even as the other mm -hmm. major central banks start to cut. Um, but if Japan keeps weakening um, and the dollar remains right. strong, then I think that means weaker Asian currencies in particular and also has yeah. implications not just for ASEAN and such yeah. like, but, but for China as well. Very valuable. Janet Henry, thank you so much for running the shop at HS at BC. We're going to go from her global look back to Kathy, Kathleen Bastianczyk. Thrilled that Kathy Bus Johnson could be here on the U.S. Uh, economic scene as well. Futures negative nine, Dow futures a negative uh, 25. I guess it's a bull market. Paul Sweeney said this first, I don't know, like three, four days ago before my sabbatical. You said you're on the Dow 40,000 watch. I was, I yeah. At you. I know. Here we I'm are, 39,000 right here, Tom. Yeah. How about that? We're there. Uh, for John the, Farrell, I know he's all over that. The VIX 13.31 says it all.
Stay with us. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning. Take a look at some of these. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg News. Remember this Bloomberg Business Flash, the latest batch of earnings you're getting is sending futures lower. Uber shares, they are down right now, close to uh, 7%. You get the gross bookings in the first quarter, missing estimates. Lyft, they reported after the close of regular trading last night. Shares gaining right now about 5.4% of the pre-market trading. Ride-hailing firm's results and outlook, they beat estimates. And then uh, Shopify shares, they're tumbling this morning. The Canadian e-commerce company said gross margins would decrease in the current quarter. This is a result of the sale of its logistics business. And right now, the S&P E-mini futures, 10 points lower. That's down two-tenths of a percent. Dow futures, down 30 points. And the Nasdaq futures, 44 points lower. That is down about two-tenths of a percent. Look to Europe. Uh, the records continue. The FTSE in London, up three-tenths of a percent, 22 points higher there. The Europe Stock 600 index, that is up three-tenths of a percent. Now, as far as uh, Treasuries, two-year yield, one basis point higher right now. We're at 484, the 10-year, that's at uh, two basis points higher. 
That is at 448. Dollar DXY up about a tenth of a percent as a result of that. And we check the markets for you all day long. Right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Paul and Tom. Uh, John Tucker, thanks so much. Kathleen Buschonsik joins us now, Chief Economist with Nationwide. Obviously, the view to Columbus, Ohio, but more than anything, Kathleen Buschonsik with a wonderful perspective away from three zip codes in New York, two zip codes, two quadrants, I should say, <laughs> in Washington, and maybe a zip code or two out at the Milken uh, Institute. Good morning, David Weston. You know, Weston's listening to us. Oh, right I know. Now. Yeah, he gets Seven, up early. 730 in the morning yep, out there. He's Beverly out there. Hills Hotel. He's up. He's got the cabana by the pool. Of course. You know, he's up. He's listening. Good morning, yep. David. Kathleen Bischonsik, I'm going to cut to the chase. You've got a wonderful, important nation, truly nationwide, no pun intended, a perspective as well. The, the, there's a boom economy out there. There's a boom stock market on and on. And yet we hear, Paul and I hear every day that America's basically flat on their back. Where's the job? Where's the better job? What about my kids, et cetera? Does this nation right now need rate cuts? Well, good morning, Tom. Happy to be with both of you. Um, so, yes, um, it, you know, I think the economy could use rate cuts. Uh, of course, as we know, what's stopping that is um, the concern that inflation is still running too high um, and could reaccelerate, um, you know, based on that. So, you know, your point is well taken in that, you know, we're, we have really have two economies right now. You have one where you have uh, the more well-off households and the more well-off companies, you know, like the large cap companies that can go to the capital markets and borrow quite easily and, and very attractive rates um, overall, um, especially relative to treasuries. But then you have small businesses and, and, and lower income and maybe lower middle income households that are really struggling. And those companies and those households are more dependent on uh, current interest rates, variable interest rates, they weren't able to lock into low mortgage rates at 3%. They weren't, you know, there are companies that were able to term out their debt and take advantage of very low, right, pandemic-related rates. So that's where, you know, I think that's the part of the economy that could use the interest rate um, relief. But, you know, again, the Fed's worried inflation accelerates, And unfortunately, the, the lower income households and, and the small businesses, they would also really be hurt if inflation's not tamed. So, it's, you know, I think what you hear from Chairman Powell and others, let's tame inflation first, then then we can provide yeah. interest rate relief. Here's a, Paul, this is unpopular, but I just think they're doing this for the fancy guys in suits and bow ties. Again, I went down <laughs> 2nd Avenue yesterday. Somebody's got to explain to me what small business does in this economy. Yeah, exactly. I was thunderstruck by the number of businesses shut down. Yep, exactly. Kathy, I mean, let's talk about the labor market here. I mean, uh, you know, we're still, I guess we call it fully employed labor market. Do you have concerns about this labor market? Do you think the Fed has any concerns about this labor market? We are indeed fully employed, um, but you are seeing on the margin some loosening of the labor market. Now, that is welcome that's what the fed was aiming for they want some moderation because if it continued to be so robust you you continue to see the economy overheat in a sense so moderation is good right now we don't have signs that the labor market is collapsing you know again just has a nice slowdown but you know the longer the fed has to keep interest rates elevated uh the more potential that we see um you know downward surprises in employment growth and wage growth which will feed into household income and then then consumer spending so we're watching it quite closely um and um you know we'll see how it, it plays out um you know going forward like for instance 170 what we got last friday 170,000. Yep. you know that's a great solid print but if we start to fall to 70,000, well then that's it that's a different story all right so again let's assume we're kind of fully employed wages are pretty solid here How's the U.S. consumer out there? Tom was talking about Second Avenue and, and, and some of the small business challenges. How does the consumer out there? Yeah, you know, if, if there's a there's a dichotomy. Um, you know, again, if you're, um, you know, a, a upper income household or you know upper middle income, you, you've got a job. Uh, wage growth is is solid. You're now outpacing inflation, and you're an asset holder, right? If you're home. Uh, prices, you know, the price of your right. home has gone up a lot. Your own equities, you're feeling pretty good right now. Um, but if you, if you don't own houses, right, or assets, 
and and right. you're uh, you're renting and you're dependent on um, you know you're facing so high inflation and high prices you're relying more on credit and and those households some of them are becoming more delinquent in their payments um, right. so there is there is where the rub okay. is and that's, you know, you, that's the struggle as usual kathleen best johnson absolutely nails this okay the partition here kathy in this society is asset holders it's like monopoly mm -hmm. do you own boardwalk and park place or not <laughs> and never own the purples okay kathy if you're an asset holder you're benefiting from the surge in rates equity markets near record highs, et cetera. A huge body of America is not asset holders. Are they represented in the Eccles building at the desk of the Fed? Oh, I, I, absolutely. Um, I, I would actually say that this group of officials, the Federal Reserve, head by Chairman Powell, um, you know, are even more sensitive than perhaps other officials. Now, they always were, but, but you know, they did the Fed talks, right, during, you know, the, since the pandemic, um, but but they feel right the biggest um, you know obstacle for for the, the those households is, is high inflation, and so they want to bring the inflation down. They see that as number one priority, and then they can provide the interest rate um, relief. Right. So I I do absolutely think that that is you know front and center for them uh, in those. Yeah, but I got a nominal GDP. If I'm running one and a half two percent GDP plus three percent. Inflation, I have what I'm going to call a sprightly mm -hmm. nominal GDP. And, and, Kathy, to me, I need proof that they can bring down service sector inflation. Or, you say, Lindsay Piegs at Stiefel says, before they come down in rates, they got to raise rates to really clamp down. Is that a feasible outcome? Is that a probable outcome, rather? So, I do think eventually the Federal Reserve will be you know, successful in bringing down inflation. It's just at what cost. Now, at some point, not now, there's, they're never gonna, in, in the current situation, deviate from the 2% inflation target. But let's say when they do their reviews, right, of, of Fed um, operating uh, policy and their goals, um, maybe that framework review, not this next one, but maybe eventually they'll say, well, should it be a little looser? Should we have a two to 3% inflation target? I think that's quite a reasonable discussion, but they can't do that now. Well, the bond market, right. you know, vigilantes would <laughs> would be at arm's length, right? They, <laughs> they would, it, you'd see a revolt in the bond market. Kathleen Bistancic, thank you so much with Nationwide. Uh, this morning. Paul, I think this is a raging debate, and I'm sorry I disaggregate. There's a huge body of America deciding which vacation to go on next. <laughs> Should we go to Paris or London? And I'm sorry, there's a lot of good prosperity out there to be constructive about. But there's a whole hunk of America that she alludes to that are not asset owning. No. That are like, okay, you got to give me a 7%. Look at housing in the country, yeah. just as one example. I mean, the inflation that, you know, most people deal with day to day. I mean, you know, just go to the supermarket. I mean, it's still the prices are just so much higher than were a few years ago. And, and the level's talk, up. The yeah. level is. And, 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 you know, for most of those products, particularly packaged goods, they're not coming down. Um, so it's just a question of, you know, where do, where do we go from here? But for a lot of folks out there, the wages still have to catch up uh, with what we've seen in inflation over the last several years. Well, there was an economist years ago, Mark Berniker, who pointed out to me once that food in Europe's a lot more expensive. Yeah. And, it, you know, we're complaining about food, but compared to a lot of other nations, it's really, it's still a bargain. But with that said, I go to, I, I do everything from pre-pandemic is yep. what I'm doing. Yeah, I think a lot of people are too, and uh, you know we've seen uh, wage increases, which over the last couple of years uh, accelerate and it's kind of uh, narrowing that concern a little bit or mitigating that concern a little bit. Uh, but so for a lot of people, you just think about what what you're paying, you know, for your grocery list now versus a few years ago, and it's just so much higher, and it just yeah. doesn't feel like the wages have, have kept yeah. up. Uh, and there you are, and that's the challenge for. A lot of folks, they feel like, are you better off than you were a few years ago? Maybe not. Yeah. Program note, pro tip, yen moves. Oh boy. It's a little bit weaker over the last two or three days. Yep. We're now out to new weakness, but it bears watching. Euro yen, 167.05. If yen weakens against euro, out through 168, it may be a hat trick. Okay. Of a All hat right. trick of intervention. We'll have nice. to see. But we're watching that for Global Wall Street. That is uh, important. Maybe not for Michael Barr, but for, I'm sorry, you know, Yen Dynamics. My Barr doesn't give up Yen Dynamics. No, please. You know, 
He's just looking for a Japanese baseball pitcher for the Dodgers <laughs> to somehow save the day. The guy for the Dodgers looks good. Who? The pitcher they have? Yes. He looks very, very good. Uh, where are we here? The VIX 13.33 with our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, John, thank you very much. An adult film star was on the witness stand at former President Trump's criminal hush money trial in New York. Trump spent yesterday in a Manhattan courtroom hearing porn star Stormy Daniels describe in graphic detail her sexual encounter with Trump in 2006. Trump, who has denied the affair ever happened, downplayed the testimony on his way out of court, saying their case is totally falling apart. I should be out campaigning right now. We're leading in all the polls. I'd like to be campaigning. We'll be leading by a lot more. Inside court, Trump was audibly cursing and shaking his head during Daniel's testimony, and his lawyers made an unsuccessful effort to have a mistrial declared. Daniel's testimony is scheduled to resume tomorrow morning. While Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial continues in Manhattan, his classified documents trial is postponed. Bloomberg's Amy Morris reports from Washington. U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon, who is overseeing the criminal proceeding in Florida, has set a whole new schedule for motions in the case and announced that a previously scheduled May 20th trial date is pushed back now indefinitely. Special Counsel Jack Smith wanted the judge to reschedule the trial for July, but the judge's order suggests she's not likely to even decide on a new date by then. It is a blow to the Justice Department's efforts to get a jury verdict in the case before the November presidential election. Smith is also waiting on a ruling on presidential immunity from the Supreme Court to determine if yet another case can move forward this year. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. The Biden administration is placing a pause on weapon shipments to Israel amid new attacks in southern Gaza. The White House opposed it as an Israeli ground invasion there, unless there's a credible plan to protect more than a million civilians seeking shelter in Rafah. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. Now, Michael Barr, you nailed it about six, seven months ago. You said the difference is baseball's become like the NBA, where it's about the individual stars. I am loving the first couple months of Major League Baseball. I mean, I, I'm addicted. It doesn't even matter who I'm watching. There's just some guy that's unreal. There are two things, like you said, the individual stars, just like it is in the NBA, and the time of the game, just like the yeah, NBA yeah, has been shorter. shortened. And now the younger people are like, hey, okay, uh, I, I can devote some time to this. It's not like me. <laughs> and I get angry, like they're in the eighth inning before I know it, and I, you know, I missed half the game. But that's great. Yeah. We're not sitting around watching Nomar Garcia Parra <laughs> change oh. He's a, like, a cash flow. This is years ago. Cash flow is doing the Nomar thing. You know, he's like four years old. That's all gone. Yeah, I, I'm funny. loving it. I, MLB, go get him. From New York City, Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Secker, the Bloomberg Newsroom, with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, futures right now point to a lower open of Wall Street when we get the cash open. In the pre-market trading, you have shares of Uber down close to 6%. Gross bookings in the first quarter missing analyst estimates. Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Minneapolis President Neil Kashkari says it's likely central banks going to keep rates where they are for an extended period of time. Investors also winding down from earnings season. 438 companies in the S&P 500 have opened their books. Close to 80% have delivered positive earnings surprises. Uh, Dow futures down 22. S&P E-mini futures down 8. NASDAQ futures down 37. More records in Europe. Uh, the FTSE in London, 21 points higher, up about a quarter of a percent. Two-year unchanged, 483. The 10 up two basis points, 448. Um, I'll close with this one. Carnival, a Disney Cruise Lines, Norwegian Cruise Lines, and MSC Cruise Lines on Royal Caribbean. They're in the race for land. Uh, cruise Lines spending at least $1.5 billion since 2019 to expand or improve private islands in the Caribbean. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much. Bloomberg Surveillance this morning. It's brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Interactive Brokers. They charge dollar margin loan rates from 5.83% to 6.83% rates subject to change. Learn more at ibkr.com slash compare. Out on YouTube, people pumped up over our baseball coverage. I saw this guy pitch <laughs> with the Padres. It's like Johnny Padres redone. Paul, 510 yeah. 175 pounds, and he's bringing it in at 96 miles an hour. It's like Dick, it's like it's a redux of Dick Raditz. His name is uh, Imanaga. He's from Japan. Shota. I couldn't believe it. I mean, he's he's got to be the smallest pitcher in baseball. <laughs> smallest pitcher in baseball, but he brings it. Good for him. Shota Imanaga from the Cubs. From the Cubs. Thank you, Jim, for that. Out on you, YouTube. Of course, you can watch the Cubs on your new iPad. Joining us right now, Mandy Singh, to straighten out 15 iPads. Was this a plus day for Apple yesterday? I sort of get this nascent feel, even XAI chat. This is going pretty well for Tim Cook, right or wrong? Well, the China numbers, I think, that came out uh, were positive. Everyone was really thinking of a yeah. worst-case scenario. So that uh, obviously is not the case. And in terms of their iPad launch, look, I'm a software guy. I get excited when I see new apps that leverage Oh, the... come on. You're so excited about three nanometers M4 chip. I am. I mean, a... it's what you and I talk about. We but geek out on that. Google has already shown that, as well as they have incorporated a large language model that takes advantage of that right. three nanometer chip. Apple didn't do that. Okay. So okay. that's the gap they got to plug in their developer conference. Okay. Everyone knows our, you know, the guy that tells me what to do, Mike Bloomberg, he's going to get the new iPad. He's going to mm -hmm. get the best one. So will John Tucker because Mike gets one. So John <laughs> Tucker is going to have the fanciest iPad out there, and it's going to say, let's do AI. What is John Tucker going to do on his fancy new iPad with AI? The first thing he will do is to engage with Siri. The, the one product that Apple has done he, something He doesn't well. know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I, I think that's the biggest <coughs> use case for AI. If this thing is real and you can you know, engage with it in a productive right. way, it has well, to manifest in a voice assistant. Let's be clear here. Tucker doesn't engage mm -hmm. with his next door neighbors. <laughs> yeah, but much less <laughs> Siri. So, all right, Mandeep, what I did not hear yesterday with the iPad <coughs> was really anything AI. I'm banking on this June Correct. developer conference. Yeah. And I need to see something that says Apple is in the AI game. Am I going to get that in June, do you think? I think so. And, and the pressure is on them to incorporate it in the next version of their operating system. Google has already done that in terms of integrating their smallest LLM with their Android operating system. That's what developers want, because then you can build new functionality on top of it, roll it out in apps. But if it's not there in the uh, development kit that Apple has with right. their operating system, it's so hard okay, to Okay, so it. to Paul's perfect question yeah. about what happens in June here, the bottom line is yesterday they brought out Logic 11, the music software, and it has three new things that are what I'm going to call AI-ish. 
I still don't understand, you know, how many iPhones are in my family, Paul? Seven with <laughs> yeah. that bill? I, I don't understand what AI is going to do to various and sundry children's iPhone. Is it, is it going to have them spend less at the, at the department store? Well, it could. I mean, look, uh, the use cases of this are pervasive. That's what we are learning in terms of the companies trying to pilot new applications. How it's going to drive that seven uh, you know, people upgrade in your family it's, it's going to be a function of, can I run this operating system just on that latest iPhone or iPad, or can I run it on that old iPhone? Right now, all the operating system upgrades that Apple rolls out, I can run it on my iPhone 11 or 12. Why do I need to go to iPhone 15 or 16? Because can you come over for dinner today? Yeah. <laughs> Explain that to the troops. All right, I, I need it. When I'm talking Apple, if I'm a shareholder or pr prospective shareholder, I have to have a call on China. I don't have a call in China. I, I don't think this is a good story for Apple. It's 20% of their revenue. It's a big part of their supply chain. I don't have a call there. What's, what do you think the call is on China for Apple? I mean, there's no doubt it will be a, you know, a decelerating business to the extent that right now it's 20%. It's going to be 15% a year from now oh, or two years from no. now. That's and not good. No, it, I mean, think about it. Fif 5% of a $400 billion revenue base. Yep. That's a pretty sizable number. And where do you make up? Even if Apple is gaining share in India or in other markets, it can't make up for that 5%. So we're talking about big chunk of revenue leaving just because uh, you know you you don't have that market anymore. So right? what do the bulls say about that? I mean, I mean what's, if we had Dan Ives in here, what would you say about, I'm gonna lose, that's 20 million of revenue, 20 billion of revenue that's just going poof. Well, so the bulls would argue, you know, it's going to happen at a much slower pace, okay. and Apple will continue to launch, uh, right. you know, new products where they will have higher ASPs. ASP growth is still the bull case for Apple. And then average selling. We got to go on this breaking news, and we're thrilled to have Mandeep Singh with us, expert on this. Da 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 da. <laughs> Intel misses for the four thousandth time. Intel sees second quarter revenue below midpoint of blah blah blah. Uh, it still sees fiscal year revenue to grow year over year. Is there a new Intel or is it the same train wreck you and I have covered for a decade? I mean, we're talking about a company that is going through a transformation and we know transformations are tough when it comes to technology. Yeah, especially so's the on Republican the Party. Come on. <laughs> when do they need a new CEO to fix this thing next? No, I, I think he's pulling all strings <clears throat> in terms of trying to revive the company through different fair, aspects, fair. foundry, chip making. It's just when you are behind in the chip business, it's very hard to catch up, and that's what Intel right. really rode on for the 25 is, years they were at the pinnacle. Is Joe Biden helping or hurting mm -hmm. Intel by his semiconductor expansion? I mean, clearly the government is helping Intel here in every possible way in terms of the CHIPS Act disbursements and just allowing them to, uh, you know, do what they can in terms of catching up. Uh, Intel getting the ASML equipment that being the latest news, that's a huge deal because okay, they missed on okay, the so EUEs. Yeah. I, I, we're running out of time, Dan. Yeah. Chris Miller, chip war. Okay, ASML's over in the Netherlands. They got to sell to everybody. How does Intel use ASML stuff versus how Taiwan Semiconductor uses ASML stuff? There's got to be a difference. I mean, ASML is coming up with a new and better machine every three months or every six months. Who do they give those machines to? Obviously, they're going to sell it. If Intel gets a preference, that helps them narrow some of that lead that TSMC and other fab makers have. So clearly, yeah. getting hold of that machine, which is in hot okay. demand, clearly so makes a difference. Were you impressed by my question there? That was very good. I got it from John Tucker. Nice. You he's, know, he's all over this stuff. Singh, thank you so much. We look forward to John Tucker speaking to Siri. Mendy <laughs> Sig on the new uh, Apple. Boy, Tom, look at <clears throat> Intel. Stock is down 40% year to date. It, wow. It's, it, don't get me going. Wow. I... I, I it, it's it's painful. I mean, it's just a, a question of everybody's looking at these chip companies as the AI play, okay. at least on you know uh, you know <clears throat> AI right. 1.0. But Intel's not participating. Tony Tennille's birthday. She's 79. Really? Wow. Yeah. And you know this was the big hit. What you got to know is in the major scale, no one owns it like Neil Sedaka. He wrote the song. Neil Sedaka is one of my gods. Here's Tony. Captain Tennille. Captain and Tennille. 
I hated this song the first time I heard it. is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Apple's still minting more money than God, right? Geopolitics front and center for global Wall Street. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Stocks are coming off of another record high. And Michael Barr with news. U.S. Secretary of State discussed the conflict in Gaza. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney. We welcome all of you to Bloomberg Surveillance. We're out on YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Bloomberg Podcast, it's a whole new concept. It's really where the future is uh, for us. Go to Bloomberg Podcast and you'll see us there in live YouTube chat. Out on Apple uh, CarPlay, Android Play, 
uh, is, well, can we have a moment of silence first for Alex Steele, who sat in the last couple of days? Yeah. Thank you. She got up early. That was, she did a great job. Yeah, somebody in my house said she's pleasant, unlike yeah, you. Absolutely. And, you know, no, she was wonderful. But Alex Steele, thank you for sitting in here to get our early mornings uh, started. Bloomberg Surveillance this morning brought to you by Cone Resnick Advisory Assurance Tax. Cone Resnick's enterprise risk management solutions can help your company drive value through stronger compliance and reporting procedures. Visit ConeResnick.com for stronger compliance and reporting procedures. ConeResnick.com, and we thank them. Um, lots going on here. Equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. This hour, currencies, commodities, bonds. We're going to do a lot of equity in the nine. Kona hate to show up here. What happened to Coco? Finally, it rolled over. Rolled over. I mean, I don't know. I mean, downstairs, the, the chocolate shop, the Swiss <coughs> chocolate shop down in our lobby. I mean, just, it was just standing in line the whole time. I mean, it, people it's would really love that worked stuff. out. Yeah, yeah, I walk. I've never been in. You yep. go outside. Yep. And Swiss to your right, thing, it's like all handmade chocolates that are you know, and blessed. Open and open completely through the, the lockdown, the pandemic, never shut down, and there's always a line in there. Yeah. People had to get their, during a the pandemic lockdown, they had to get their um, cosmetics across the street at Sephora and had to get their chocolate. That's yeah. how it works. Yeah, I went in there, bought a nice box of chocolate as a gift for someone. It was like this big. The mortgage. And that was $20. Which child did that was $20 mortgage? for yeah. like four chocolates. Does Swiss know their chocolate. Yeah. I walked in, I said, do you have any Fanny Farmer French mints? And they looked at me. <laughs> no, the Entenmann's. I was from, <laughs> I was from <laughs> America as well. How about a Bloomberg Business Flash with futures negative 10? John Tucker. Yeah, under a little pressure this morning after some of the latest earnings reports. I uh, got results from Intel. It's an earnings miss there. Intel now says it expects the second quarter revenue below the midpoint. Their excuse, the Commerce Department revoked some export licenses to a customer in China. And checking shares of Intel right now in the pre-market. Lo and behold, they've just turned higher and they've just turned lower again. <laughs> down 1%. Let's say it's volatile trading. And then we'll move on to Uber shares. Uh, right now, they have uh, turned higher up 2%. Uber Technologies reporting gross bookings for the first quarter. They missed analyst estimates. Now, as for uh, U.S. futures right now, they indicate maybe a lower open on Wall Street at the cash open. The Dow futures right now, 14 points lower. The S&P mini futures, they're down 9. The Nasdaq futures right now, uh, 50. Different story in uh, London and overseas in Europe. FTSE in in London, they are pressing higher, more records in Europe. The FTSE is up three tenths of a percent. The Europe stock 600 right now, three tenths of a percent higher. A dollar DXY up close to two tenths of a percent. Yields right now, the two year is at 483. That's relatively unchanged. The 10 year up two basis points, that's at 448. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Paul and Tom. Uh, thanks so much, John Tucker. There are moments in you doing this, folks, in the blur, the privilege of doing Bloomberg surveillance with Paul Sweeney and all that we do every day where time stops. One night in Davos, in a piano bar, before the music played, nice. I sat for an hour with Lord Laird, Richard Laird, a giant of economics. Paul, he invented... How do we figure out how happy we are? <laughs> and like this became like a cod. Jeff Sachs called me up one day. Us. He goes, you got to do this thing with me and Lord Layard on, on happiness. And we did a whole thing at Davos on this. It was absolutely phenomenal. Drinking the Kool-Aid at the London School of Economics years ago with Lord Layard was Dirk Willer, who joins us now from Citigroup. Dirk, Dirk just what was it like dealing day to day with a giant like Richard Layard? It, it was really fascinating. I must say, I, I was there before his happiness uh, research days. So you were there um, for the sadness. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it, it was also happy days, but it was much more uh, focused on Russia because at the time yeah. he had a big consultancy project uh, in, in Russia, in Moscow in the 90s, and that was part of that. Um, so the happiness came later, I think. Let's start there with Citigroup and your work there, owning the high ground and emerging markets as well. Is Russia now, with the war, with the new, the next term of Putin, is it a frontier economy or an emerging market economy? 
I mean, it always was an emerging market, but I, I would say um, certainly many, many steps back from the optimism that, that we, we had all in the 90s, clearly. And at this stage, obviously, completely uninvestable for for anyone uh, in the U.S. Yeah. and therefore not really a, a research topic for us, unfortunately. All right, Dirk. So when I think of city, uh, I think of terrible elevators at 388 Greenwich Street, but I also think of a global global view unlike any other institution. So as head of global kind of macro asset allocation, where are you telling clients the opportunities are on a global basis? How do you start from that 30,000 foot level? Yeah, the elevators have improved. So we had, uh, of course, a big renovation um, while we were sitting in the building. So, um, <laughs> but but it's it's behind us and, and all is good. But um, you're right, I mean, the, our global reach is obviously a, a big advantage. I mean, I would say just in terms of asset classes, it's still a world uh, primed for equity outperformance. And the reason is that I think we are um, in a still reflationary world, not in a stagflationary world, as recently some uh, have uh, you know, made a case for. But a reflationary world, we are somewhat early cycle, at least when it comes to the manufacturing cycle. We see a bottom in the manufacturing cycle uh, broadly across the globe. Um, and that usually is good for equities, it's good for credit, it's good for commodities. It's not overly good for government bonds. Usually, it's actually negative for the dollar. That hasn't played out so far. But the other themes are in play, I think. And, um, and that keeps us broadly positive risky assets. Now, I would say, if you look at this very moment in the cycle, credit is as expensive as it ever has been. So the, the spreads are yep. the tightest for that moment, which leads us to equities over credit, actually. But we broadly think we are in a good spot. All right, if we're equities, maybe more than credit, given the, the tight spreads, where are equities? Is it U.S. or do we go outside the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, we are still big believers that, uh, that you know, the, the, the general cycle um, has to be played where in, in cyclical markets, really. And the, the cyclicality can be expressed partly on the tech side, and that's where, you know, the semiconductor cycle we still think is in an up cycle. And, um, and then if you just look at the equity markets that do well when the manufacturing PMI is rising, that leads you to the US, that leads you to emerging Asia, very importantly, so Korea and Taiwan, um, that also includes Japan, and then the less cyclical ones, um, actually surprisingly, LATAM is not showing up as overly cyclical because it really depends very much on China, not on the global cycle. Uh, the UK <coughs> shows up as not very cyclical. So we, we focus on emerging Asia and the US very right. much, which also has, of course, a, a high tech component, which we still think is where the fire right. is, and you're supposed to be where the fire is burning. Dirk, I look at the standard deviation on yen and, of course, the rate folly in Japan as well. How does that affect emerging Asia? The, the emerging, you mean the FX part of it? In the, the FX the yen part, but, but well said. The FX part, but also combined to the rate folly, the interest rate folly of Japan, their experiment in reflation. How does that affect yeah. Singapore? Yeah, and in general, it's true that the yen on the one hand and to some extent the renminbi are clearly setting uh, the scene for all of emerging market fx uh, emerging asia fx so basically as long as the yen is under pressure the rest of uh, em asian fx is under pressure too now japan has obviously stepped up um, because for a long time they were very happy with the big yen it was part of the policy it was desired to have a big yen um, that has changed but, but the big issue for them is, of course, that they sterilize the intervention, and it's, it's a, not a bilateral intervention either. And these interventions just never work. And so at best, they can um, hold the line here a little bit, slow things down, but in the right. end, it will all be about U.S. rates, right? right? So I don't think it makes a difference that they change their policy on the end mm. uh, for emerging Asia very much. It it. it does make it a little bit harder to, to play this EMFX carry trade that everyone loves to play, right? Because you're basically a long <clears throat> Latin FX, short Asia FX, right. and um, how short do you want to be if they really intervene heavily? But, but right. you know, we don't think the yen goes far, so we still actually like the carry trade. Dirk Willer, thank you so much for Citigroup. group. Don't be a stranger. Let's do it again. I, I like the sad, he studied sadness at London School yep. of Economics with <laughs> exactly. the Lord Layer. Mike Spector, Chris Prentice at Reuters. Moments ago, Tesla Autopilot Probe, U.S. prosecutors focus 
on securities and wire fraud. That is a breaking story. Tesla down 2.7%. With our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul John, federal judge Eileen Cannon in Florida presiding over Trump's classified documents prosecution, has canceled the May 20th trial date, postponing it indefinitely. Loyola law professor Jessica Levinson spoke to CBS. She said there's just a lot of evidentiary issues to sort out. And she is pointing to the fact that we're talking about some concerns about national security. And that does raise additional questions for any judge when they're overseeing a trial like this. Trump faces dozens of felony counts accusing him of illegally hoarding classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida. Trump took them with him after he left the White House in 2021 and then obstructed the FBI's efforts to get them back, according to prosecutors. He has pleaded not guilty and denied wrongdoing. Porn star Stormy Daniels testified yesterday at former President Trump's New York hush money trial about a sexual encounter she says they had in 2006. Daniels says the encounter led to her being paid off to stay silent during the 2016 presidential election. Testimony resumes tomorrow. The U.S. paused the shipment of bombs to Israel over concerns that Israel was approaching a decision on launching a full-scale assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah against the wishes of the U.S. More than a million civilians are sheltering in Rafah. Far-right Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene says the ball is in House Speaker Mike Johnson's court after two days of meetings between the pair over her push to have him removed. Green says she wants the speaker to commit to several actions. They include no additional funding for Ukraine. What I'm trying to do is, is give Mike Johnson a chance to be a Republican speaker, and he seems willing to try to do that. Speaker Johnson told reporters he and Green are still talking through ideas, but stressed this is not a negotiation and that he will still continue to do his job. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. Uh, Michael Barr, thank you so much. I've been remiss on this, Paul. We need a redo on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I mean, the chart looks like Microsoft or Google or even, you know, beleaguered Apple as well. It's about ready to break out the new record highs. I just did a fancy log chart on it. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's like a boom chart. They still got the wind. They still yeah. they still doing it, right? Yeah, two hundred sixty billion market cap stock. It's up twenty five percent year to date. It's up about eighty percent over the past year. Yeah. So it's just been an extraordinary story. And it, you just look at the profitability, Tom, and it just shows that streaming uh, can, in fact, be extraordinarily profitable. It's, and we saw Disney yesterday get profitable for their streaming business for I mean, the first time ever. So we'll see if they it's can. It's terrible. I mean, the last decade. Netflix has done 25.1% per nice. year. That was just because of the chess show. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the reason. Good morning, folks. Bloomberg Surveillance.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. A U.S. futures right now indicate a lower cash open this morning. Let's start off with this report from Reuters this morning. Uh, prosecutors examining whether Tesla committed securities or wire fraud by misleading investors and consumers about its electric vehicle's self-driving capabilities. According to this report from Reuters this morning, the Justice Department examining other statements by Tesla and CEO Elon Musk suggesting the cars can drive themselves. Uh, this morning, shares of Tesla, they are down close to 4% in the pre-market. We've also seen some uh, volatile trading of the pre-market. Uh, on the earnings front, Uber reporting earnings this morning, those shares they are now down right now 7.2%. Uber Technologies reporting gross bookings for the first quarter. They uh, missed analyst estimates. And then uh, shares of Intel right now, they were lowered down 2.3%. The company says it expects second quarter revenue below the midpoint of $12.5 to $13.5 billion. Down futures right now, 57 points lower. That's down two tenths of a percent. The S&P E-mini futures, 17 points lower. That's down three tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq futures right now, 86 points lower. That is down half a percent. FTSE and London, more records in Europe. That was up three tenths of a percent right now, up about 23 points. And we check the markets for you all day long. Right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker. And that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Paul and Tom. John Tucker, thanks so much. Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney, good morning to all of you on Apple CarPlay, Android Play, and YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Lots of good things happening uh, out there, including our replay, this entire three-hour show with yes. Tom Storrs. Uh, we replay it. You can see it. A huge demand from the left coast. I yep. mean, they're like, okay, they're not we're not up, up at 4 a.m. Yep. We're not doing it. So we've got a replay. Really, the replay is for the milk. Carol Masser said, you know, I need a replay. Sure. She's out at milking. Yeah, I know. I know. You know, she's styling. Hobnobbing. Hop, very, very hobnobbing. Yep. I'll say, they, they all went to Michael's last night for dinner out there. <laughs> Anyways, you look for our milking coverage as well. David Weston leading that coverage uh, with uh, other uh, worthies. Joining us right now, and what's great about this is it's a really informed note, not only about, like, What's yield going to do? What's the Fed going to do? Forget about that. We'll cover that uh, with 14 other guests. But the flow of money out of your treasury. Tom Satoris joins us right now. He is with Strategus. If things change for the treasury, now that we have a higher coupon, they're doing this and that with the Fed. But is there going to be like a dearth of bills or too many notes? What's the flow look like right now? Well, short term, we're probably looking at a dearth of both bills and notes. That is, the Treasury has no immediate need to increase its financing, so it doesn't have to come to market and increase coupon auctions or bill, bill auctions. So we're going to be going through a seasonal period, which, by the way, could last up to two quarters here based on, on, on um, tre Treasury's own projections right. and tax uh, takes that we could see a, a fairly uh, muted um, right. treasury market because of supply. Simple well, that's what I've heard. But the critical question is, after John Tucker paid his taxes, <laughs> did, the, did Washington get its fair share? What does the, quote, tax take look like this year? Well, I, I think the official numbers are somewhere around $280 billion or so. Yeah, that's Tucker. Um, that was just from John. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. and, and, and big picture here is it's better than it was last year at this time, but it's worse than prior expectations. So it's not as good as was previously projected, and that does mean there's an incremental increase in uh, need for bill issuance um, this quarter versus what was previously expected. But either way, this is the seasonal strong patch when it comes to Treasury revenues. And that's the important takeaway. And we shouldn't extrapolate that for over 12 months. This is, we just finished yep. April. People paid their taxes. All right, uh, Excuse us, let's get an anecdotal report on that. I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. Well, John Tucker, did we pay our taxes? Are we talking about the federal or oh. the <laughs> state? And local property taxes, so we which are big... far, far more. Yes. <laughs> Thanks to living in New Jersey. Uh, wait till the congestion tax comes to hit Mr. John Tucker. Can't wait. Exactly. All right. Given that background, Tom, what are you guys baking into your outlook for this Federal Reserve? 
Yeah, so it, it's fascinating because everybody's focusing on the, oh, the Fed held firm, they held steady, yep. they have no change in interest rates. In fact, they're kind of backing away from the three cut mantra. That's hawkish, baloney. The Fed cut balance, the pace of balance sheet reduction, particularly on the Treasury side, from 60 billion per month to 25 billion per month. When you talk about the impacts on the economy, and in particular the impacts on the financial markets, the Fed funds rate really does not matter that much anymore. The balance sheet matters wildly. And that's where the most important action was. And so the Fed is telling us they've already starting to ease. Okay. The process has begun. And no surprise, you saw equity markets rallying bond markets rallying. There's other factors here at play as well, but the slowing of that pace of balance sheet reduction, it clearly is an advantage to long duration assets. All right, 10 year treasury, we're sitting here today, you know, 4.47, 4.48. Where do we end up, do you think, year end, do you think? Well, I think it's gonna be a roller coaster. So okay. where we are at the end of the year, very well may be four and a half percent. How we get there is gonna depend on the evolution of the inflation data, the size of the deficit heading into the fourth quarter, but our base case forecast right now is we see yields, 10-year Treasury yields dip a little lower mm -hmm. between now and let's say mm -hmm. Labor Day, and then begin to gradually make a migration back higher. So down to 4%, back up to 4.5% is our current forecast. When you and Jason Trenner meet, which is Paul, it's usually like once a quarter, maybe <laughs> twice a quarter. When you two meet, how does the yield world that you have fit into Jason Trenner's equity world? And to me, the dynamic there is cash that's out there. We had somebody on a couple days ago who said we've basically never seen the cash like we've seen now. When does that cash break and how does it break to go to equities? Well, so the primary way that we think about how the bond market, and let's just again focus on 10-year Treasury yields, the primary way we think about it, two primary ways. There's one, the impact on S&P valuation, let's say the S&P multiple, and two, the impact on credit markets. What we've found simply over the last year is a 10-year Treasury below 5% adds some marginal stress to the credit markets. But once you get up to about 5%, you start getting stress in the credit markets and valuations across the entire global asset space begin to wobble lower. So as of right now, the recent empirical evidence suggests to us that a 5% 10-year Treasury yield is the break point at which everything begins to unravel. So the primary ways we think about it is simply through valuation and the alternatives. Now, with 10-year Treasuries at 5%, it's attractive to not just equity investors, but cash investors, corporate bond investors. So a lot of asset classes begin to migrate into Treasuries when you get 10s up to those levels. All right, I got the two-year 4.83%. Do I sit there? or are you telling your clients to take, maybe take some credit risk? So we uh, uh, made a gutsy move with our fixed income portfolios about two weeks ago when 10s hit about 465. We said it's time to add about a quarter of a year duration. We did that. A quarter of a year duration. So, and, and um, primarily in the government space. And so we're now sitting on a 20 basis point rally lower. We're telling clients to hold. We wouldn't be adding duration now, but our expectation is 10s are gonna push a little bit lower, yields down to maybe four and a quarter, at which point well, in time we'd take some profit on that. But to your wonderful answer there on 5% ramifications, do you model out that on a fan distribution? Is that possible? Is it possible for- 10 year to five. Oh, absolutely. So the most important data point in the next couple of weeks is that CPI number, I think next Wednesday. If that comes in hot again, then the Fed is going to look like it's still a little too dovish here and markets are going to start to price in a higher for even longer and sure tens are going to make another move back out to the 470 level right. and if we get a strong jobs report next month then five percent is in the cards for tens yeah. program mm -hmm. note i would love to do two blocks with you and jason trenner mm -hmm. that would be really yeah. cool smart folks like, this is really like you know learn hugely informative tom Stores, thank you so much on fixed income at strategus with jason trenner there on the bigger picture and also blue chip stocks uh, as well. Blue chip stocks aren't doing all that well, negative 18. And I would say, uh, Paul, with the Intel announcement yeah. of an hour ago, and now Reuters with their Tesla announcement on some forms of investigation of Tesla for autopilot, I mean, yeah. the, the, the news weighs this morning. I'm not doing autopilot, uh, are you kidding me? I mean, Ed, uh, look, although on, uh, the, on yeah. the new wheels, they do have some serious kind of autopilot stuff yeah. on there, but still the hands are on the wheel. Ed Ludlow's been a huge value add on this, yes. seriously folks. He's out on Twitter, Twitter like yep. doing a Twitter run <laughs> as he's on autopilot driving off the Golden State Bridge. It's a huge <laughs> value add.
Futures negative 18, Dow futures negative 62. From New York City across this nation, Bloomberg Surveillance. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Hey, and I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. And futures right now indicate a lower open on Wall Street. Uh, futures uh, are driven lower in part by the earnings report uh, that we're getting. Let's start off, uh, given its weighting, with this Reuters report, prosecutors looking into whether Tesla misled investors and consumers about it, uh, the electric vehicle's self-driving capabilities. And as we look at uh, the uh, pre-market right now, shares of Tesla, they are lower, over 2%. And Intel says it now expects second quarter revenue below the midpoint of 12.5 to $13.5 billion. 
after it was informed by the Department of uh, Commerce that it was revoking some export licenses to a customer in China. And, of course, uh, the big story of the morning with Uber Technologies. They reported gross bookings in the first quarter, missing analyst estimates. And as we look at the uh, Dow futures right now, 61 points lower. That's down about two-tenths of a percent. S&P E-mini futures, 19 points lower. That's down four-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq futures right now down 96 points, down half a percent. FTSE in London up again, up about a quarter of a percent right now. Two-year yields unchanged, 483. The 10-year yield, that's two basis points higher. That's at 448. We check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Paul and Tom. Uh, John Tucker, thanks so much. Economic indicators this morning and into next week in a key CPI report. Brought to you by Commonwealth, always Commonwealth. Commonwealth supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. The romance of economies. Where did it begin, Paul? Remember? The romance of? It began with the Fidelity and Fiduciary Bank <laughs> two-thirds of the way through Mary Poppins in 1964. And the brilliant Dick Van Dyke does a spin <laughs> on one firm out of London that goes back to 1783. Really? E.D. and F. Mann. This is the Roman. When you Learn study commodities, new. folks, which I did because they trend, it's for, it's, it, you lose less mon money with commodities if you don't leverage up. And the, and the answer is the romance of it was out of London. Yep. Going back centuries with E. D. and F. Man in our going to break out in morning. song. Yes, yeah, exactly. right. he's going that direction, you know. <laughs> Jim, Jim, Cherry, <laughs> Kona Hake here to save us from ourselves this morning. We are thrilled to have you here. How is the commodity business right now? I, I, when when Coco goes to the moon like it did, is everybody on board? Or is there seven people you know in Dubai? I mean, <laughs> how's the commodity business right now? I mean, it's it's. It depends which commodity, right? So energy, metals, softs, ags, they're all running very separate little individual fundamentals. So right. you mentioned cocoa. I mean, gosh, that's not for the faint-hearted. Cocoa is the commodity that doesn't ever get talked about, and yet it's been on everyone's lips in the last... Why did it break the last two weeks? What happened to make it break? Um, okay, so simplistically, it just got too high. And really? I think, it wasn't like a fundamental issue? <laughs> no, no. To be honest, no. If anything, fundamentals have not changed at all. I think what we've seen is potentially some... Um, it just got to this level where there was hedge lifting, um, there was... Speculators had actually left the market quite a bit already, mm -hmm. but there were still some spec longs. Okay. Those, those decided to exit. And the chart just broke. I think you just suddenly started to see. All right, GLCO, the Global Commodities Monitor on the Bloomberg Terminal. That's all you need to know for me, because I don't know anything about commodities. But then I click on Coco. And I see back in September 22, I don't know, was it 2,400 something or others, whatever, the bush or whatever it is. Then it triples over the next like year and a half. What happened to make Coco triple? Now it's pulled back a little bit here, but is there a reduction in supply? Was it a technical trading thing? I mean, it's just chocolate. What's going on here? This isn't gold. So it's chocolate and it's inelastic demand. Everyone likes their chocolate. Yep. There is no substitute as well. It's the there only. There is no substitute. Good. There is no yeah. substitute. There is the, the, feed, the feed ingredient is cocoa, and cocoa is only grown in Ivory Coast, Ghana, and West Africa and pockets uh -huh. of Latin America. It's too concentrated right. in one particular part of the and world. And so it's a supply issue? 100%. Oh, okay. In Manila today, it's 95. South of Manila and Iloilo tomorrow, it will be 96 in the Philippines. Japan has a massive heat wave. Uh, John Tucker this morning at a climate report where the, the average April was up 2.8 degrees or whatever. In your world, is heat now a new heat and will it change the soft world? It's being talked about too much now and for a good reason. There's heat stress, as you mentioned, in all the Southeast Asia, in parts of Africa, in, Dubai, in um, the Middle East. It's intense and climate change is definitely causing more extremes. And it is causing stress on our crops. And so 
in when going back to cocoa, what we saw is that in West Africa, we've just not be, the the cocoa trees are dying. They're full of disease. You had um, unconventional weather, which led to poor yields, and unfortunately, we're now in the third consecutive deficit, and no supply to be seen. Is there a recovery. winner? Is there a winner in the softs? If you believe climate change is here to stay, I mean potentially. If prices go up because the people, the, the markets realize that there's a supply-led um, shortage, eventually prices will go up and that should incentivize the producers to ultimately reinvest in their crops. But that's not as straightforward because right now most of these producers, at least in Africa, are not reaping these super crazy high prices because they've already sold and hedged their crop yep. forward already. So it's not really easy. Speculators have been coming in, dipping into the softs quite a bit recently. We've seen them in cocoa and coffee. They've definitely made a buck or two there. Um, we've even seen oil traders come into cocoa because it's been so volatile. But it's not um, its no, not easy to say who the winners are. I mean, arguably, the food manufacturers, the Nestle's, the Mars bars, you know, yep. they're the ones who enjoyed low prices for such a long time, and now they're probably suffering a bit. Dumb question of the day. Uh, you, you listed a handful of small West African countries that can pr uh, you know, produce cocoa. We can't do it in Mississippi. We can't do it in... Is it a, is it a... It is 100% tropical. It's a very specific um, latitude within the uh, either side of the equator, yeah. And you're and you're trying to grow cocoa? I'm trying in my backyard, yes. I'm thinking, you know. Now, remember how it's pollinated. It's pollinated by fleas that are carried on the backs of wild boars. What? Yes. No, I gotta I'm call not BS making on that, that up. I gotta call BS what is this, <laughs> wild kingdom? <laughs> Just let you know, they don't have wild boars wherever... Okay. I, yeah. While we're watching I, the Yankees and stuff, he's he's <clears throat> going on Wikipedia and just he's going just, down these rabbit holes. Of he, well, you know, <laughs> he, he needs to be medicated. <laughs> um, Krona, I, I, I look at where we are, and a great help for us has been Javier Blas, who's world famous in petroleum. And he's got a sidecar industry in olive oil. <laughs> I spoke right. to the former finance minister of Spain, who basically lied to me that there isn't a drought in Spain. Olive oil's through the roof. So do, do you, within KDNF, do you look at olive oil, which is something every listener's interested in, and is it like basically here to stay like the other beleaguered climate change categories? No, so it, number one, olive oil doesn't have a futures industry, and so it's difficult for us to trade that. Um, it is quite niche. It is a Mediterranean um, um, commodity, clearly. And I do know it has been suffering from droughts in those specific regions you mentioned, re um, Spain, Italy. I, I propose immediately that there's a futures industry. I'll be a good player. You'll be long Spain forever. Paul, get one more in here. Kona, what's the, uh, what's the commodity that people are asking you about your view the most yeah. these days? Today, it's coffee a lot. Um, okay. And uh, in particular, because coffee prices have risen sharply, and they were thinking, oh, is this the next cocoa? Okay. Um, and and rightfully though, again, fundamentals in the coffee supply demand situation is, is very tight. Um, we have Vietnam, which again, heat stress has, and dryness has caused uh, a shortage of Robusta, which is the stuff you eat for a drink um, in espressos. Um, so Robusta coffee is definitely tied in terms of supply demand fundamentals. Arabica is produced in Brazil, but they also had um, you know, a couple of years yep. of bad crops following by frost, and you don't get frost right. in Brazil. Exactly. That's very ab abnormal. We recovered from then, but then you had a bout of droughts, and, and you've just not had perfect weather, so, and this is a recurring theme. Yep. In the trenches of KDNF, are you guys basically meteorologists? We do have one. We have. I think any agricultural soft commodity trader has to have in-house meteorologists within the research team, and I definitely have. So, one. like, it's nine o'clock at night, and you're watching Juventus AC Milan, or whatever you're doing, and you got your your iPhones open to whatever your meteorologist thinks. I mean, it's that. <laughs> You guys live and die by the weather, right? Yeah. So our meteorologist is based in India. We're constantly getting rainfall updates in, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Vietnam. Okay. So yeah, it's this has super. been a joy. Yeah, Don't great. be a stranger. <laughs> yeah. Come back on. Kona Haig, live with us in the studio from KDF, and uh, man, just absolutely definitive on all the, seriously, all the stuff we use uh, each and every day. Futures deteriorate, negative 24. Intel and Tesla news this morning. We'll have that for you through the morning. Dow futures at negative 88. The VIX out a little bit, not much. 13.50 in the 10-year uh, real yield, 2.17%. <laughs> 
elevated ever so uh, slightly. Uh, with our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, John. Adult films actor Stormy Daniels testified in former President Donald Trump's criminal trial. She recounted meeting Trump in 2006 and the subsequent payment and a non-disclosure agreement she entered afterward. That $130,000 payment to silence Daniels, paid by Trump's former attorney Michael Cohen, is at the center of this case. The federal judge in Florida presiding over the classified documents prosecution of former President Donald Trump has canceled May 20th trial date, postponing it indefinitely. The order from U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon. Loyola Law Professor Jessica Levinson says, while the Supreme Court deals with the issue of presidential immunity, all eyes remain on Trump's New York trial. We continue to look at the New York hush money trial as, frankly, I think the only trial that's going forward before the election. And depending on what happens in the election, potentially the only trial that moves forward at all. Because for the two federal cases, if Trump wins the election, he can ask his attorney general to dismiss them. Professor Levinson spoke to CBS. The U.S. paused the shipment of bombs to Israel. It's over concerned that Israel was approaching a decision on launching a full-scale assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah against the wishes of the U.S. Parts of the Midwest were hit with severe storms overnight with heavy rain, high winds, and some reported tornadoes. Tornadoes responded in Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. Two twisters damaged Portage, Michigan. This woman lives there. The house across my street from us, their garage is totally gone now. Um, they're missing part of their roof. The house kitty corner from us has trees on top of it. My neighbor's house around the corner is almost completely destroyed. Officials say fortunately there have not been any serious injuries reported. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. I'm going to tee up in a minute. I mean, you know, I got the plague. I'm, you know, I got the plague, folks. I'm yep. fighting a little. Hanging in there. Well, I'm hanging in there. Paul's being patient. Michael Barr's not. But, you know, <laughs> David Gurr walks in. I saw it just long. And, you know, he's such a stud. He comes in from Brooklyn and he's got tea here. From Sacred Vibes Apothecary. Really? I mean, it's not Lipton tea. No. It's like some fancy herbal. That's all David Rule. How much I is guess. he getting paid? Because whatever it is, it's too much. If he's buying that stuff. <laughs> it, it's, it's spring herbal rum. It's a spiritual. It's a spiritual herbal herbalism. <laughs> Who? It's, it's, they were such. A, they did Carlos Santana like nobody. And what's even better here? He was going to get me the cleanse package, but it's the fighter. <laughs> Package. Fighter package. Right? It's the <laughs> fighter package. David Gurr, thank you and thank you to Sacred Vibes Apothecary for this. Yeah, there team. you go. Absolutely. David Gurr, he's in Brooklyn. That's how the Brooklyn guys, that's how they roll, John. <sighs> The kids are all not these days. Oh, I None feel like it's, it's, a, it's a fighter package. <laughs> it's, that's what we need here on a Wednesday morning. A fighter Pennsylvania, package. Pennsylvania, Jacks. You know, Pennsylvania, we follow Jack. And that's it's it. It's called a Stroh's beer. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. What yeah. I, <laughs> that's what I thought. David Gurr, thank you. We'll look for him. The big take. Look for that yep. pocket. Also, rumored a return of Matthew Miller. That's hot right. pursuit. Could be back next week, is kind of what the Auto's scouting report is saying. It's just too much. Beard? What's it? Let's uh, get I the roulette so. on here. Barr so. wears a beard, but you know, he's Michael <laughs> Barr. Who knows? Matt Miller sends beard. Good morning.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Futures indicate a lower open of Wall Street. Down futures right now down 70 points, down two tenths of a percent. S&P E-mini futures 21 points lower. That is down four tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq futures right now 111 points lower. Uber technology, those shares in the pre-market uh, most active, down close to 9%. First quarter bookings, missing estimates. Shopify shares, they tumbled in early trading. The uh, e-commerce company in Canada saying gross margins will decrease as a result of the sale of its logistics business. And then uh, we're from Reuters that prosecutors looking into whether Tesla misled investors and consumers about it, uh, the electric vehicle self-driving capabilities. And shares uh, right now, they are lower in the pre-market, down about 4%. We check the markets for you. All day long, right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, John Tucker, thank you uh, so much. Futures in negative uh, 21. Uh, Bloomberg Surveillance uh, this morning is brought to you by IBKR Financial Advisors. Switch to interactive brokers for lowest cost. Global trading and turnkey custody solutions. No ticket charges. No conflicts of your interests at IBKR.com slash RIA. In 19, I think it was 12, five years after the panic of 07, which is seared in my memory. My family got crushed in it, to be honest. Really? JP Morgan wrote a check, literally wrote a check. And the price of it was they had to set up a Federal Reserve System. It took five years to set it up. And of course, the, the hinterlands did not trust New Yorkers like Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway. No. So they had to set up regional feds, and one of them was Richmond, which has had a character of its own from day one. The modern character was established by, among others, uh, Marvin Goodfriend and a lot of Carnegie Mellon, uh, in what's called Tidal and Freshwater Economics. And it moves on with Thomas Barkin. What a joy for Tracy Alloway and Joe Weisenthal Who? to travel with Tom Barkin Take it. They they did two breakfasts. They did the Barney's Cafe breakfast, yep. and then they did the Derby Restaurant breakfast okay. in Mount Airy, North I'm Carolina. I'm looking at it right here on the map. This is like a legit road trip. Like you guys went out to a rotary lunch or whatever. Yeah. yeah. With Tom Barkin, that is way. <laughs> this is like where the rubber eats the mold. Forget yeah. about. Bloomberg, you oh, know, Mike man. McKee and all that. What was it like, Tracy? I feel like I have to correct the record, which is that, in fact, we went to Waffle House, and I think, was it Biscuitville for breakfast? And Biscuitville for breakfast. Biscuitville. Nice. And the Waffle House was for dinner, even Waffle though we House ate breakfast food. Food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was excellent. In, in Nashville years ago, we called it Shea Waff. Yeah, it was Shea Waff. So, how was Shea Waff oh, you, with Tom Barkin? I was in Guatemala a couple weeks ago visiting my mom. They have Casa del Waffle there. The <laughs> exact same branding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding at all. What did Tom Barkin say? What was the experience like? So I think the interesting thing in this is that, you know, you hear about Fed presidents like going out and talking to businesses and they'll make references to this is what we're hearing on the ground. But what does that actually mean? Like, what are they actually doing to gather that sort of information? We know that they have all these official statistics, everything from non-farm <coughs> payrolls to jobless claims, whatever. But when they're gathering that kind of color and anecdote, what does it actually mean? And I have to say, Tom Barkin, maybe because of his history um, as a senior partner yeah. at McKinsey, but he has that background experience and that really seems to be a lot of his focus it's going out and meeting people in his district right. and asking them things like what are you seeing in terms of inflation what are you seeing in terms of labor what are you seeing in terms of availability of credit and then using that right. bringing it back to the FOMC. so what do those people say in north carolina joe weisenthal to tom barkin yeah there are a few different things i mean we talked to for example a manufacturer of carports which I wasn't totally sure what that was until I saw them, but turns out this part of North Carolina is like the Silicon Valley of carports. Like there's so many companies yeah. and they, they're sort of like the, you know, the detachable garages, oh, so to yeah, speak. Okay, yeah. It's like put over sun damage. They were talking about how they're seeing very intense price pressure. So they're, they're absolved from contributing to the inflation problems. They talked about how at their size, they definitely feel banks pulling back a little bit. So confirming that maybe the rate hikes actually are do, doing something to some extent. 
Most of the companies, you know, I talked to a tech, two different textile manufacturers while there. Most of them seem like they're pretty good on labor yeah. now in terms of filling slots, but you know, up and still like, you know, and they have their own issues with childcare for their employees and housing. So a lot of these issues nationally, but hearing where they are directionally, which is what Tom said, which is that it helps to have these conversations yeah. to augment the data so that when we talk about something like, is there still more hiring left to do, they can get a sense of like, yeah, but how much does that really look like? And also so that you can see the difference in the tails, yeah. right? So one of the interesting things about those two textile manufacturers, one was pretty big, one was pretty small, and the pressures that like, either of them are facing at this current moment are very, very different. Like the larger company seems to have some pricing power. Mm -hmm. The smaller company is really feeling the competition. So you don't get that when you look at aggregate statistics, right? You don't get that kind of discrepancy in the tails. I got a lot of experiences. To me, it's a huge deal. I really, what, I'm thrilled that you did this. <laughs> There's oh, way you. too much, you know, I say it all the time, Paul. It's like, a navel gazing from three zip codes in New York. I know, you and I gotta get off this island, Tom. B Bullard was big on this, you know, out of Indiana University. Yeah. You gotta go out in the trenches and find out. How apart, Joe Weisenthal, is America from those three zip codes in New York City? Man, that's a, that could be a very loaded question. But what I would say is that, that I think one of the things that really struck me is that they experience a lot of the same things that people talk about, say, in New York City. Housing shortage is a really big one, but the dynamics sort of come at it from the opposite direction. Here, for example, you know, we talk about, oh, it's so hard to build new housing and stuff like that. There, the issue is they need to go out and pitch. The town, the town development board needs to go out and pitch like one of the major home builders to say, look, there is a case to build homes in Yadkin County, uh, North mm -hmm. Carolina, or Surrey County, uh, North Carolina. And so I'd say many of the issues are different, or sorry, the same, but the dynamics from which they emerge is sort of becomes distinct. And so that's how I would probably answer it in the most safe way. One right. thing we did learn is that childcare also yeah. seems to be an issue, even really? in smaller towns okay. where you would assume maybe there's like a sort of community mm -hmm. built um, source of childcare, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So we spoke to uh, one project manager who is trying out this new model of childcare and they were describing how I think availability of childcare had just dropped dramatically in that yeah. county. I can't remember the exact statistics, but I think it was over 50% mm -hmm. since the pandemic. And that is very familiar familiar to anyone with yes. small children yep. in New York. Same thing. So I'm looking, I had to, quite frankly, I had to Google map Mount Airy. It's I okay, knew we I, did too. We I know from Andy, Andy Griffin, but it is in the northwest part of North Carolina, a little bit northwest of Winston-Salem. Um, it is you know, in the western part of the state here. So when you were walking along the streets, Tracy, I mean, it, we're in the Waffle House. How did the folks there feel oh, yeah. about... Uh, <laughs> just the outlook. How are they thinking? I mean, what's what's top of their mind? Yeah, I think the thing that I sort of came away with, and Tom emphasized this in a lot of his speeches to the local Rotary clubs or, you know, local leaders and property developers and things like that, it's this idea that like things don't go away that quickly. The scars of 2020 are still weighing on businesses, but also right. in places like yeah. Surrey County and Yatkin County, the scars of 2008 right. are still weighing yeah. too. That's, that's one of the reasons there's a shortage right. of housing. And the scars of 2000 and China's entry to w WTO yeah. and the right. so it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah scars yeah. on scars. I knew there was a whole ulterior motive here. <laughs> Tracy's doing front work for Light Sweet Crude. I mean, that's what's going so on. So, the, the, the weird, the, we the did, most, yeah. a, you know, we there was a gospel, rec, the gospel guitar store by the, a famous yeah. local gospel yeah. bluegrass artist. Really? And we walked in, and our producer had his microphone, and we were all sort of nicely dressed. And I think we got we got looked right. at pretty suspiciously. But then I played a gospel <laughs> song that I wrote on one of the guitars, and I think they like warmed up to us. Yeah, what was the name of your gospel song? Uh, it's called It's Never the Wrong Time to Pray. I tweeted a, uh, a one minute version of it. The proprietor the of the store liked it. Yeah, and she, she was, was the. She she yeah. was the daughter or the granddaughter of the found the this guy. This guy he was part of the Easter Bra the Easter, the Easter brothers. brothers. Yeah, yeah. Right. so she yeah, seemed yeah. to warm up to us after. Our so are we going to see? I need some news. I got to make some news today. Forget Tesla and Intel. June seven and eighth, two thousand twenty-four. The Bluegrass and Old Time Ooh. Fiddlers Convention. Are we going to see Light Sweet Crew there with David Gura? I was just going to say, I didn't even, I only when we got there did I realize that our colleague David Gura has this connection. I don't think we're going to make it down there, um, but hopefully David does. Maybe he'll report back. We'll, we'll do that. <laughs> we'll record an episode of The Big Take from uh, yes. the Fiddlers Convention. <laughs> we'll have to see. Guys, great. Odd Lots with Tom Barkin. Look for that. Tracy Alloway and Joe Weisenthal.
Ace, same time as Captain Tennille, real music. is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. 
Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney, Bloomberg, Samantha. I'm going to tear up here. Kona Hake with us from KDF. Yep. Man in London. Brian Belsky in moments from Toronto. Everybody's out It's too about. much. Yep. He's with BMO. We're going to talk. We're going to get right to it because he's got some important things to say, uh, particularly on real estate. A little lightness to the market. Tesla headlines. Intel headlines, this headlines, that headlines, the VIX 13.47 uh, uh, oil. It's just sort of like we're churning. We're waiting for data, inflation data uh, next week as well. Bloomberg surveillance this morning brought to you by BNY Mellon Insight. Let me spell it Insight, I N S I T E. Insight, June 4th to the 6th, Nashville. Don't miss the essential event for the financial advice community. Visit insight.bnymelon.com insight.bnymelon.com run I'm apple carplay android youtube paul the live the live chat here you're all over it it's like talking with the kids out there yeah i mean they're you know they're they're into commodities and i don't know the contractors show up about it. <coughs> now excuse me folks i'm fighting uh, the plague uh the bloomberg business flash <laughs> i'm Jen glad Tucker. we're in a hermetically sealed room with you then <laughs> There we go. They got it out. Okay. So Paul's going to be out tomorrow. I'll be out the next day, is what Brian you're saying. Belsky Brian's going to be out for the week. <laughs> John Tucker with the Bloomberg Business Flash. All right. Think? Right now, futures under pressure, indicating a lower cash open on Wall Street. Down futures, 60 points lower. That's down two tenths of a percent. S&P E-mini futures, they are down 20, down about four tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq futures, 110 points lower, uh, down six tenths of a percent. Let's go through all the headlines. Reuters reporting prosecutors in the U.S. examining whether Tesla committed securities fraud or wire fraud by misleading investors and consumers about the self-driving capabilities of their cars. The Justice Department examining other <laughs> statements by CEO Elon Musk suggesting the cars can drive themselves. Uh, given its waiting, Tesla shares right now uh, down 3.5% uh, pre-market. And we've seen some volatile trading in the uh, pre-market as well. On the earnings front, Uber reporting earnings this morning. Those shares, they are down right now uh, about uh, most actively traded, down 8.7%. Gross bookings in the first quarter missed analyst estimates. And then uh, we also had Intel telling us that uh, it now expects second quarter revenue below the midpoint of 12.5 to $13.5 billion. Intel shares, they are down 2.2%. And uh, also, uh, it, uh, it's worth noting that the Reichsbank, they cut, and that could be the impetus for further cuts in Europe uh, by the central banks there. As we look at uh, yields, two-year, that is unchanged, 483, and the 10-year, the benchmark, is two basis points higher. That's at 448. We check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Paul and Tom. John Tucker, thank you so much. Worst job on Wall Street, without question, Nicholas Rockanova is to put up with Brian Belsky. As they write, and folks, what you hate about Belsky for years, and you know, his bio says he's been doing this since 32 years, he's 12 years old, and he got a job at Opco. He talked his way into it a few years ago. And the problem with Rockanova and Belsky is they write these hyper detailed four page notes that you get your pencil out, the surveillance pencil, and you take forever to read them. And what gets my attention, Brian Belsky, it's just simple this headline. Real estate has become oversold. Have you gone long office buildings? <laughs> Good morning, Tommy. It's, it's wonderful to see you. By the way, it's 35 years. I'm the Doogie Hauser of uh, Wall Street. Uh, and you should all pray for Nick Rockanova. He's worked for me for 17 years. It's, it's the worst job on Wall it's Street. The worst. I stole him from the fixed income desk at Merrill. I mean, obviously, you know, you have to, uh, as an equity guy that is typically and historically bullish, you need to have that other side. Yeah, you need to have an adult that can Yeah, the adult you. in the room. You need an adult okay. in the room. And so my entire team, I've kind of put together as kind of more fixed income and banking people just to... Right. Just to kind of keep me. So, what does Rockanova say about real estate? You're really so, going long office buildings. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's the deal. We're maintaining our neutral rating. Uh, we own. Uh, the good thing about uh, what we do is we have the opportunity to put our money where our mouth is, Tom. Where we own and run. Uh, $7.2 billion of assets at BMO, meaning from a separately managed account basis, we, own, we run 10 portfolios and two uh, ETFs for asset management. And so separately, we own 16 REITs across that board. Obviously, Canada is a very big REIT market, but so too is the United States. So, so where are you going with this, Belsky? So 
think differently if you have the analysis to back it up. And I learned that from, first off, William O'Neill, as we've talked about through my time with you uh, through the years back in the early 90s, and then Dane Bosworth, I worked for a gentleman by the name of Bob Dickey, mm -hmm. that um, taught me how to be contrarian. And the best book that you can read for investing has nothing to do with investing, Tommy. It's it's The Art of Contrary Thinking by Humphrey B. Neal. It was before World War II. If you have the analysis to back it up, be different. So I was marketing a few weeks ago in New York, and this client was really pushing me, and I love that, right? Because that's how you think differently. Like, Belsky, what are you contrarian on right now? So when you take a look at valuation, Tom, operating performance, earnings, and, and, and overall relative performance, REITs are there. Right, REITs are there. Everybody hates REITs. We're convinced that we're never going back to work again. We're convinced we're going to have a commercial real estate crisis. We're convinced that Prologue is never going up again. But look at the results of Simon Properties. Look at the results of some of these REITs. We think thematically, again, we're talking 2.5% of your portfolio out of $100, right? But I believe, again, let's go back about the call. We think we're in a 25-year secular bull market. On a near-term basis, we think the market's overdone here. We think there could be a bit of a pullback. Our theme for investing in 2023 is everybody love everybody. Own a little bit of everything. And we think we've entered into the most dynamic stock picking environment in my career. The closest thing I would say is 1995, 96. Maybe 83, 84, but really 95, 96, where it was all about stock picking. And we did have asset classes move together, growth, value, small cap, large cap. So that's why REITs, we think, from a valuation perspective, they're clearly oversold and they're clearly hated. And overall, we have now reared an entire generation of investors, Tom. The last 17 years, they only believe that stocks go up if interest rates yep. go down. All right, so what REITs do you like? I see American Tower. That took I took that company public back in the day. What else? Talk to us about REITs. What sectors of the REITs? Because a REIT is not a REIT is not a REIT. There no, are so many different exactly. categories. Exactly. So we like, actually, you know, if you take a look at Prologis earnings, they were terrible, right? But if you take a look at going forward, we'd like that name when we've owned it for a while in terms of where the cash flow is and where the, where the growth is. We've owned Simon Properties uh, in different portfolios and different firms since 2008. Uh, we, when we came to BMO in 2012 and we put our product together in terms of our separate lane managed account, it's one of the first REITs we bought. And we're longer term holders in terms of how we look at things. We also like a small, um, two small mid cap companies, Park uh, and, and Cube. And we like the Cube because of the storage side of things. And uh, we think, in, especially in the New York metropolitan area, uh, we think it's an area, it, it's a theme that works. Broader, very broadly, technology REITs. Yeah. Industrial REITs, healthcare make a lot of sense. How about, so, what is your call on office? Our call on office is we're going back to work. And we're starting to see re-imaging in the office space too, much like we saw re-imaging of retail space uh, post the great financial crisis. I know it's expensive, but I think it makes sense, especially given the we need more housing in this country. I've got to ask you, just because of the timing, Bethany McLean at Business Insider out with a lengthy effort on Blackstone yeah. and their real estate. Now, I'm assuming the private equity, private debt of Blackstone is removed from the REITs you're looking at, but in your call on real estate, can you roll that over to Blackstone recovering? Yeah, well, first off, uh, you know, Blackstone got crushed, obviously, in 2022 when rates were going up, right? Private equity doesn't work when rates go up. And then it obviously reverse. We bought it, and talk about contrarian, we bought it in October of 2022. And obviously we were very happy with the, with the return on that. 50%, I think, right? Yes, this we're very happy with that return. Now, I think you wanna really, in, this is where stock picking comes in, right? You have the macro in, with the interest rate scenario. And we've also shown in our work that in a 50 to 100 basis point change in the 10 year right. treasury, REITs outperform. Now let's talk about Blackstone. I think from a private equity perspective, just in terms of their business and the lending side of things and the alternative lending space and with respect to private equity, I think that works. In terms of the real estate side of right. Blackstone, I think it's right in the sweet spot. Brian Belsky on Apple. Oh, <laughs> listen, you know, so I was very blessed at a young age. Uh, again, 12 years old. In 1990, I met Opco. Warren Buffett. Well, mm -hmm. this I met him at I met I met Warren Buffett at, at William O'Neill and Company in 1990, and then seven. Becky Quick was there. Continue. Yes, <laughs> actually, Becky Quick. When I ran into Warren Buffett and Becky Quick in 2017. He looks at me, and goes, "Hi, Brian," and I like, I said. I, he said, I met you in 1990. How amazing is that? Anyways, yeah. how, very humbling. Anyway, follow the money, Tom. 
follow the money. You gotta follow the cash flow, you gotta follow the earnings. Right. I believe Apple's been very humble in terms of what it's been doing in AI. And don't underestimate how important this kind of joint venture with Google is with Apple. I love Apple stock. It's actually one of my top holdings across all of my portfolios. Brian Belsky, BMO Capital Market. Thank you so much. Too short Thank a visit. You. Let's do it again uh, soon and uh, often is Thanks, Tommy. Well. Futures are negative 20, Dow futures are negative 57. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, John. Porn star Stormy Daniels will resume testimony tomorrow at former President Trump's New York hush money trial about a sexual encounter she says they had in 2006. Daniel says the encounter led to her being paid off to stay silent during the 2016 presidential election. Yesterday, Trump sat just a few feet away from Daniels as she described their alleged one-night stand. Legal experts say while the case is not about the alleged encounter between Trump and Daniels, those details may be important for prosecutors to lay out their case. Criminal defense attorney Arthur Idella. They don't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt they had, they had sex. They don't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they even knew each other. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the checks were cut, that it was decided to put it in the book improperly, and then, or, or like label it inaccurately, and that that was being done for election law fraud. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's criminal trial for allegedly mishandling classified documents has been postponed indefinitely by U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon in Florida. It's a blow to the Justice Department's efforts to obtain a jury verdict before November's presidential election. The U.S. paused a shipment of bombs to Israel over concerns about a potential military offensive on the Gazan city of Rafah, which President Joe Biden opposes. According to a senior administration official, the delivery was supposed to contain 3,500 bombs. Days after Texas Congressman Henry Cuellar was indicted on bribery, money laundering, and conspiracy charges, the Democrat is publicly denying all allegations. Federal prosecutors allege Cuellar and his wife accepted bribes in exchange for influence in federal legislation and regulation. Reporters caught up with the congressman. Those are uh, allegations that my wife and I are innocent. Uh, and uh, all I've done is to serve my district. Representative Cuellar went on to say we will let the attorneys take care of it. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With the Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr. This is hey. Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, John. Bloomberg Business of VAR. I mean, yep. Mike, help me here with the Knicks, Indiana. Like, I guess they're going to go at it again. Does every game end with a controversial call? Where the NBA has to wax philosophical for two, three, four days. Well, let's hope there's no kickball in this game. So, yeah, listen, they, this has been going on for the Knicks. You know, the refs have had, you know, their controversy. Did you call this? Why shouldn't you Is call that? Is it new, that? Michael Barr? Is it no, new? this has been going on yeah. since 19 dirt, and it, it will continue to go on. Okay. There you I, go. How do they look? They beat, they look the, they beat they the Pacers. Look good. I mean, they have great fantastic. defense, and the Pacers are great in offense, yeah. so it's... If they get two more injuries, Paul, they're calling me exactly. in. Exactly, they're calling me in. <laughs> we'll have to see. Our future's in negative 20 from New York. Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, futures right now indicate a lower cash open on Wall Street. Dow futures 47 points lower, down about a tenth of a percent. The S&P E-mini futures down 19. That's down four tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq futures right now 107 points lower, uh, down about six tenths of a percent. Uh, partly in the driver's seat, some of the earnings this morning. Uber's first quarter bookings missing estimates, pushing its shares uh, right now in the pre-market. Most actively traded down. 8.1%. Shopify shares, they tumbled in early trading. The e-commerce company saying gross margins will decrease as a result of the sale of its logistics business. And then we had word from Reuters uh, on Tesla. Those shares right now in the pre-market, 3.6% lower. Reuters reporting Tesla uh, prosecutors in the U.S. Uh, trying to figure out if Tesla misled investors and consumers about the electric vehicle self-driving capabilities. And then this could be a cue for the rest of Europe. Uh, important to note this morning, Sweden's Reichsbank kicking off its rate-cutting cycle, easing policy for the first time in eight years. Uh, Two-year yields in the U.S. right now unchanged. 483, the 10-year, is up three basis points. That is at 448. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg business flash tom and paul john tucker thanks so much paul it was like you know end of january hot stove league february and i'm reading the boston globe yep. and i'm you know i'm miserable the winter's out and i'm talking to emily Rowland, and i go emily you know you just you come to new york and hang out and she goes i'm not coming to your show until the red sox have the best pitching in major <laughs> league baseball this is and? the shock of the year the boston red sox picked for last have the best pitching in Major League Baseball right now. How'd that happen? And they're playing 500 ball, which, you know, <laughs> tells you what the hitting's doing. But we are thrilled. Emily Rowland here with John Hancock of Boston. And I should also point out, she's got the best call, which is just own America, own quality. Boom, I'm Stop down with that. Stop screwing around. Do you stay with that theme? We do, Tom, and it's really all about following the earnings and following where the best fundamentals are following across the, the cash world. Flow. Follow the cash flow. And not only are we seeing U.S. mega cap tech companies, yes, they're overvalued, but they're doing the bulk of the heavy lifting right now as far as earnings growth goes. It's a key reason that we've had a preference for U.S. equities. We're also following where the money's going. We are spending like crazy in the United States right now. It's not a political opinion. It's just happening. And it's really unusual that we're employing fiscal stimulus and increasing the size of the deficit at a time where the unemployment rate is less than 4%, but it's being funneled into industrial production. There's a manufacturing renaissance taking place across the U.S. Midwest right now. So we're playing that by emphasizing things like mid-cap industrials and in portfolios. So we're pretty much, I don't know, 80, 85% of the way through earnings here. What have you seen so far that's either giving you conviction in that call or maybe you said, uh-oh, we got some headwinds? Yeah, I mean, earnings have been okay. Um, you know, they remind me a little bit of my son's grades. Uh, he's in eighth grade. <laughs> oh, don't go there. His report card's, like, not very good, but he's still <laughs> on the lacrosse team right now. Go Marblehead. Um, so, you know, they're, they've been fine. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you look at it, it's almost like I picture like a glacier, right? You know how only the very top part of it is showing. And it, again, it's really those mega cap tech names, communication services, consumer discretionary. Those sectors are up 30, 40 percent year over year, handily outpacing the S&P 500, which broadly is up only about 2 percent when you take those sectors out. So earnings has been fine, but again, they're dominated by select groups of companies. So how do you think about valuation then? Do we... I mean, I, I, two ways to look at it. One, you just kind of look at the broad market. Maybe we're a little bit rich. Yeah. A lot of folks say, hey, pull out some of those magnificent, however they are, and it's we're okay. How do you guys think about it? Yeah, I mean, it's really about a balance. So we have a valuation issue with those mega cap tech names. In fact, right now, the S&P 500 growth index is trading at a 45% premium to oh its 20-year average. So we still like tech. We're not downgrading it, but you've right. got to balance that with stuff that's actually trading on sale. John Hancock, with his venerable tradition, actually sticks to prospectus. Are your large cap portfolios forced to sell big tech because it's gone up so much? Well, it's now that's a big problem for active managers because it's hard to be overweight. 
those stocks. So I think there's mm. some limitations there as far as um, sector construction. Um, what we're doing is we're balancing that with carefully selected parts of value. Think of it as like quality at a reasonable price. Those are the types of stocks we want to own, ones with great balance sheets, tons Such of as, cash, I don't mean great stocks, return sectors, on equity. Give me sectors, come on. Yeah, so we're overweight, the information technology sector. We also like things like industrials, which we talked about, which have good earnings prospects. They're high quality, great return on equity. Um, we do like healthcare. Um, sometimes I don't love talking about it because <laughs> what, it's been what, an area what that's is, no Why one won't healthcare <laughs> finally know. go? I mean, you and I were younger, Paul, when people started talking about this. Why won't healthcare pop? I think you just need to see that rotation into more defensive parts of the market. And think about what's outperforming right now. Um, you look at Bitcoin, crypto miners, small cap equities, Chinese equities. It's like there's this massive momentum trade that's been spurred by this risk on sentiment. And it's really been just around the Fed hinting last fall that, that we were going to cut rates and then kind of reiterating that message a bit last week when we heard that we we're going to, you know, kind of start reducing quantitative tightening and, and, and those other, you know, measures that are more dovish. So I think it's we've been thinking about this environment like a, a phase. And I've been thinking about I don't know if anybody's have ever had teenagers in their house, but no. they can go through these no. like phases which can be weird and erratic and hard to understand um, and that's kind of what it feels like right now in markets is you're having decelerating economic growth the april data are not that great yep. but markets are rejoicing because it's reviving hopes that the fed can start yep. cutting so we're we're in a phase that we're trying to get through um, and kind of ride out right now with those higher quality stocks. How about on the fixed income side? Do I sit in my two-year treasury at 4.84% or do I take some credit risk out there? I'm so glad you asked that. Bloomberg is the place to talk about bonds Darn and, right and I is. love that. Um, you know, it's pretty remarkable to see some of the volatility in rates. I don't think it's been talked about much. We just saw the 10-year <clears throat> treasury yield yep. fall by about 20, 25 basis points in just over a week. Um, we look at any backup in bond yields as really attractive right now. Um, you think about the aggregate bond index yielding 5.3%. That's yeah. pretty awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. that's actually close to the 20-year high of about 5.9% and well above the 20-year yeah. average of three and a quarter. We like income. Now, you're doing lacrosse at Marblehead. Is that what I just that's heard? That's right. Yeah. How many summer camps is a cherub oh going to? <laughs> what a racket. Yeah. They go to Walt Disney. Are they going to Dartmouth to the Mountain Dog? We are looking at some lacrosse camps we are this looking, summer. Do you have a consultant? At, yeah, I know, right? It's unbelievable. I need another job. You do? Uh, yeah. Yes, you do. Trust me. Yeah. But you're looking at, you know, three or four camps. Yes, all the elite colleges, of course, will take your children for a week of lacrosse instruction. doesn't even matter if they're good, by the way. Textbook's not included. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Does Duke do this, Paul? Does Duke of course, must have a lax Of course, camp. Lawrenceville does it. They all do it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Got to keep those. I looked up Tabor. I figured the trek from Marblehead down to Tabor near Cape Cod would be too much. They don't have a lax cap. They take your money in ice hockey. <laughs> exactly. So Marblehead, that was that like forty-five minute drive, hour drive to the Boston. Well, and on a Sunday morning, it's about twenty minutes. Okay. But uh, on a Monday morning, it's a different story. Oh, yeah. Okay. They, 12, they 12, got a great miles. folky coffee house up there. Do they? Yeah, it's, it's up there. It's but you know Salem. It's right on the water, right? Like Salem. Yeah, and that kind of yeah exactly. I get, yeah. yeah, it gets warm about July fifteenth. Yeah, exactly. That's when We're the starts. sailing capital of the world. Is that right? Well, some people say Newport, but okay. Marbleheaders. No, no, it's, no. Us. it's yes. like real, the real sailing. Real sailing. You know, okay. Yeah. You know Hinkley and all that. Yep. You know, there you, you go. go. All right. You, do you have the picnic boat? I mean, I mean that's no, like no. my dream boat. Tom. That's your the dream Hinkley boat. The Hinkley picnic boat. Yeah, Tom Purcelli, when he took his job at Pigeon. He demand he didn't demand he asked and they give he takes a picnic boat down the Hudson River every Amazing. morning every day to my go to my husband's a fisherman then so he can't have that okay well yeah <laughs> but but a picnic boat I could see you in a picnic oh, boat oh right yeah you know let's a little do Marblehead in, let's do Marblehead in August we should okay come yeah. on up yeah. remote yeah. broadcast yes yeah remote. Emily Rowland Johnny Hancock road trip thank you so much thank you she uh, does the equity markets and you know we we didn't gloss over it but she has been dead on about the recovery of this market to another leg of a bull market, particularly in quality stocks. Paul's Intel a quality stock this oh boy, morning. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you think about uh, you know what's happening mm. with the chip stocks, and they're just not there yet. Will they they get remind there? me. You know, I don't mean to compare them, but the 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 just the decade long Boeing yes disaster. Yep. Interesting. We'll have much more on this. Look to Edward Ludlow, Bloomberg Technology, for coverage on that. From New York City. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with the opening bell report at the New York Stock Exchange. There you have it, the opening bell. And uh, this comes as uh, futures all morning long. They have pointed to a lower open on Wall Street. And as we look to, to the Dow Jones Industrial Average at the open, down 65 points, down two-tenths of a percent. The S&P 500, 20 points lower. That is down about four-tenths of a percent. Uh, still waiting for the first trade for the, uh, the NASDAQ. Uber shares right now, after their earnings report, 7.8% lower. Uh, gross bookings missing on soft demand in Latin America. Increased legal costs cut profitability. And then you have uh, shares of Intel in the early going down 2.8%. One percent. Uh, the second quarter revenue uh, to fall below the midpoint of the previously issued projections. That's because of a new U.S. ban on chip exports to Huawei. Uh, right now, the Nasdaq, uh, the first trade down six tenths of a percent, 103 points lower for the Nasdaq Composite Index. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That is the opening bell report. Tom and Paul. Uh, John, thanks so much. Joining us now, the former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve System with PIMCO and, of course, forever herder of cats at Columbia University <laughs> within their Department of Economics. Um, I, I've got – it's going to be a four-hour conversation, and we're only doing it a short block this time with uh, Vice Chairman Clarida, but we'll make it a much longer conversation next time. I want you to reaffirm, recapitulate your Economist article of seven, eight, nine months ago where you shook the industry – by saying, forget about 2.00%, it's going to be some number higher. Revisit that right now. Well, thank you, Tom, and always great to be on the, on the show, especially in studio. Yeah, in that essay, I highlighted that, um, that I thought the Powell Fed and really global central banks uh, were really aiming to get inflation down to what I called two point something. <laughs> uh, and the idea was inflation was up to five, six, or seven at the peak, uh, and the goal would be to get it in the zip code of the inflation target, but in terms of dealing with the last mile, uh, to let the economy sort of get to the last mile on its own without another leg up in rate, rate hikes. And, that, and that's what I think we're seeing in the U.S. and really mm -hmm. around the world. Is the Fed restrictive now? The polarity of market economists we speak to is there's a select group saying, you know what, they could go up further and then come down. And there are those others saying, stop it. They're way above the real rate. Bring it down now. Which is it? They, 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 they think they're restrictive. I think they're restrictive. I think there can be a debate on how restrictive. The Fed's thinking, which I think makes sense, Tom, is that the longer they keep rates here, and importantly, the longer they signal they're going to keep rates here, they will become more uh, restrictive. And so, yes, I'm certainly in the camp that they've done enough. And the real question is, how long do they have to keep rates uh, at this level? Rich, well, Tom and I will speak to people both in academia and in practice that says, the Fed should be cutting now. Yeah. If you look at the real-time data, inflation is maybe not whipped, but we're pretty darn close. We should be cutting rates now. What do you, how do you think about that? If I were still in the building, I, I would not be in the camp to be cutting now. It certainly looked like that was feasible coming into the year, but you know, since the beginning of the year, the inflation numbers have been going in the wrong uh, direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, I think that, uh, Especially, I think what's relevant here is an element of risk management. So I think there is path dependence. The fact that the last three years inflation has been well above target, I think it makes it a harder call to cut uh, preemptively. So I do think, you know, sometimes central banks say they're data dependent and they're not. I do think the Powell Fed now is data dependent. And yeah. I think they're ready to cut if the inflation data starts to proceed as they expect. How do you think this Fed is looking at the labor market. I mean, I, Tom and I, we kind of throw out this term, it feels like we're at full employment. Everybody who wants a job kind of has a job. Yeah. Wages are going up in, in, at a pretty re reasonable pace. How do you think the Fed looks at the labor market today? I think they see a labor market that is robust uh, by a, a variety of measures, not just the unemployment rate, but uh, but other uh, indications, and that's a good thing indeed. I think one of the first speeches I gave as vice chair is I made the point, you know, the Fed is not targeting wage inflation. It actually likes it when folks get a nice raise, but raises have to be consistent with the inflation target. And you know, we've gotten some good news on productivity in the last 
uh, year. Productivity growth is yeah. now around 2%. Uh, and 2% productivity growth with 4% wage increases, if sustained, gets them pretty close to where they want to be. So I don't think there's a lot of adjustment required in the labor market from here. If you're joining us right now, Richard Claret, a former vice chairman of the Fed, and of course with Columbia University. You're a certain kind of monetary uh, economist, of course, with DSG with uh, DSGE with uh, uh, Jody Galley. And I think of Megden Desai over at the London School of Economics coming from a totally different world. Megden got, Lord Desai, got so upset about our fiction of equilibrium that he wrote a book about it, 2008-2009. In DSGE, there's a respect for Valris in some form of normal equilibrium. How can we measure equilibrium now if we don't have a clue what productivity is doing? I just don't buy it. Well, I think we measure it with pretty big error, Tom, and you're absolutely right that not just productivity, but a lot of inputs into yeah. theoretical DSGE models, R star, term premia, uh, equity premium, are all uh, unobserved and measured uh, with, with error. So I always thought, and I, th I said this on your show, and I've said this in the halls of the Fed, you know, models are a place to start, but not to end the conversation. Uh, <laughs> and in particular, you know, folks would criticize, say, DSGE, that they're three equation models. Well, I think, Every economy needs to have at least three equations, but there are a lot more. So, so Tom, it's a starting point, but it's not a destination okay. to get to the but answer. But the 250 PhDs, whatever it is at the Fed, <laughs> at least, yeah. they've all studied Clarida, Galley, Gertler, and the rest of it. Yeah. I, I get it. They've studied this stuff. Yeah. Is it germane right now? Our listeners say, you got to be kidding me. After the shock of a pandemic, yeah. a triple stimulus, throw the equations out. Does Chairman Powell have equations now that are effective, that, are, that have some form of use? My sense, obviously, from public comments of not only the chair but the committee is that they've understood, Tom, for some time that the shock was sufficiently unusual and substantial um, that they need, they can and they are relying less on models uh, and more on the way the data um, evolves. You know, Tom, on one hand, you know, the models were telling them that to get inflation down from five and a half to two point something, they need to have a big increase in the unemployment rate. And, and both Governor Waller, Chair Powell and others said, look, the economy may be different this time. We don't have to assume a big cratering in the labor market. And that was actually right. a positive development. I can't say enough, Paul, how I agree with this. And then this is Paul Powell has been hit, hit like a pinata. Hmm. Powell led saying, do we really trust these equations? And Clarida, who invented the equations yeah. at Columbia, <laughs> hey, you know, Stiglitz, Stiglitz, they got their, their equations. Some of them are real simple, like Stiglitz and Grossman, and others like Clarida, it's Greek to me. Yeah. But the answer is, do they matter right now? And Powell's led on this. I they know. And, and Tom, one of the key issues for a lot of folks is, the consumer here, I mean, you know, there's a tale of two cities, if not more, out there with the U.S. consumer. A lot of folks are really struggling, particularly if they don't own assets, whether it's real estate or, you know, stocks or bonds and things like that. And how does the Fed think about the consumer here? How do they gauge how the consumer's doing? They look at the earnings from Walmart. I mean, what do they do? Well, the, the Fed staff has a, devotes a lot of resources to the consumer, not only at the aggregate level, what is total consumption, but also increasingly during the time I was there, focusing on the, on the distribution, in, both income and consumption distribution across the population. And there are a lot of things that, that can you, you can monitor, in particular, how many households are laid in their car payments or credit card payments. And so certainly, certainly the Fed spends a lot of time on the bottom-up analysis of the consumer. So Again, we came into the year, Richard, I mean, the market was discounting six rate cuts. Yeah. Now we're down to less than two. I mean, the market has no idea what's going on out yeah. there. Uh, is the Fed, from your perspective, are they happy to say, hey, we've done a lot of work here. We've raised rates. We had a major impact on this economy. Let's just wait and see how our work plays out. Is that kind of where we are, do you think? I, that's exactly where they are. In fact, the, the chair got that uh, question at the press conference, and I'm paraphrasing, but his answer was along the lines of, we judge that policy is restrictive, and we judge that if we keep it here long enough, it will be sufficiently restrictive. So that's definitely their mindset. They're data dependent in terms of when the cut and how many cuts are, are, are going to happen, uh, but they certainly judge that, that policy is, is restrictive uh, here, and they just have to keep it here. One of the great moments now in economics, uh, Professor Clarida, 
is your colleague in crime at Columbia, Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winner, yeah. is out with a wonderful new book, very thought-provoking, should be read by conservatives, The Road to Freedom, Economics and the Good Society. You two are both victims of the Midwest. And <laughs> one of the great, great advantages here is Clarida and Stiglitz are like, eh, would everybody calm down? There's a whole other country out there. Yeah. Tell me about policing as Dean of Columbia Economics, Joe Stiglitz. <laughs> I can't fathom that as your day job. What was it like telling Joe Stiglitz well, you will teach this course? Well, no, look, Joe, Joe is a treasure, and I'm actually proud of the fact that when I was department chair back in 2001, I recruited Joe to uh, <laughs> uh, Columbia. It, it was one of my big big accomplishments. Uh, I'm an enormous fan of his research. He's an incredible uh, colleague, right. uh, incredibly uh, creative. Um, and I, you know, I right. just wish we had 50 more Joe Stiglitzes <laughs> with or without the Nobel Prize. Why should conservatives read Stiglitz, The Road to Freedom? Well, I'm, I'm reading it now. I listened to the, a podcast uh, the other day. Uh, look, it's, it, it gives, I think, an, an informed and nuanced assessment of the power that economics can have about thinking about the world if you're willing to step away from the oversimplifying assumptions. And much of Joe's career has been driven by a curiosity about the world and providing a structure uh, to think about it. How do you think about this, this U.S. economy? A lot of uh, we hear recently about the ex exceptionalism of the U.S. economy vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Let's think Germany or Asia. Let's think China. Um, is this something that is unusual, this kind of decoupling, if you will, in terms of performance? You know, that term means different things to different people. What is clear, I think, is through the rearview mirror. La last year, uh, many, many predictions of a recession, not only did a recession not happen, but growth was a point above a trend, a very hot uh, labor market. Uh, I think part of the exceptionalism theme relates to excitement about AI. Mm. AI is a big deal. It's not clear if it'll be a big deal in the next six months or six years, but it is a big deal. And obviously, mm -hmm. U.S. companies and U.S. innovation right. are poised to benefit uh, from uh, that. But there's another dimension, I would argue, in which the U.S. is exceptional, exceptional, but in a poor direction, which is that we right. have an exceptionally irresponsible fiscal policy. <laughs> um, and if right. you look at the CBO numbers, uh, they are they are, are <clears throat> frightening. Essentially, yeah. deficits of five, six, seven percent right. of GDP, as far as the eye, eye can see. So exceptional in multiple <laughs> directions, I would say. One final question. Yeah. We have a presidential candidate, a former president, who basically wants to take the independence of the Fed away. From your reading of our political economy, can an individual, can a single president remove Fed independence? Certainly not. I think, I think the legal standing of that issue is clear uh, and uh, decided, and I would Two points. One, Jerome Powell will serve out his term, which goes through May of 26. Secondly, there are no vacancies on the Federal uh, uh, Reserve uh, right now. So uh, for, for the foreseeable future, there's, there's, there's no, nothing for a future president to do uh, on that yeah. account. This, is so, this has been fun. Did we do OK? Yeah. yeah. We get a quality <laughs> C? Yeah, yeah, gentlemanly C. I'll take that. <laughs> Richard Clarida, thank you so much of Columbia University and, of course, the Fed and with PIMCO. Thank you, folks. Uh, as well, just really, really wonderful. It's great to do this not on a Fed day. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what's the Fed going to do? Yeah. You know, and all that. Bloomberg Surveillance this morning. We're brought to you by BNY Mellon Insight. June 4th to the 6th, Nashville, Tennessee. Don't miss the essential event. For the financial advice community, visit insight.bnymellon.com. Let me spell that for you. I-N-S-I-T-E, insight.bnymellon.com. We thank BNY Mellon. Uh, for their support. We thank PIMCO for dragging over Richard Clarity here today, not on a Fed day, uh, is, is well. Uh, futures, are, well, we're, we're open for trading now, I should say, and we've improved off of futures. A down negative 14 SPX frag fractional. From New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Yeah, and I'm John Tucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom. With this Bloomberg Business Flash, the major stock averages right now lowered a little change in the early going. Nine of the 11 major industry groups in the S&P 500 are down. Uh, biggest drag coming from consumer discretionary. That's where you're going to find the shares of Tesla. Tesla under scrutiny by prosecutors over whether it committed securities or wire fraud related to its self-driving claims. That's the Reuters report. We should point out we've known about this probe, uh, the investigations uh, for some time. Uber dropping close to 5%. Gross bookings missing on soft demand in Latin America. Intel, the biggest laggard in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The U.S. has revoked licenses allowing Huawei to buy semiconductors from Qualcomm and Intel. Uh, that's according to our sources. Uh, shares of Intel, 2% lower. Qualcomm shares, they are down three quarters of a percent. Overall, the S&P 500 down 10 points. A decline of two tenths of a percent, 5177 on the index. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down 17 points. And the NASDAQ 100 right now, 45 points lower. That is down three tenths of a percent. We check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker, and that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Paul and Tom. Uh, thanks so much, John. Uh, Mick Mulroy joins us, uh, Mulroy joins us right now. Uh, senior fellow of the Middle East Institute, uh, not in acquaintance with public service to the country, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East at Defense, and also his uh, effort with the Marines over many a year. Uh, Mick, thank you so much for joining again. Uh, I, I believe, Mick, the way they do it in the Marines is they say, get out the map. I don't think enough Americans have gotten out the map of southern Gaza, Three miles from Rafa up to a Mediterranean Sea is a constraint. And maybe nine miles south to the tip of Gaza into a desert in the middle of nowhere. If your world is the study of degrees of freedom, where do those people move in Gaza? Uh, so it is very good to be with you guys as usual. Uh, it's very difficult. There's no doubt about it. The the population that we're talking about inside Rafa, the over a million, so about 1.3 million, are largely there because they've relocated from other areas of Gaza, yeah. including all the way up to Gaza City, Khan Yunus. And now I think wh where they're looking is, is a coastal area, predominantly because Hamas isn't in the coastal areas because you can't dig tunnels there. So they're trying to move this large population, and I think around 50,000 have already moved in the last two days uh, to this area to get them out of the path of either a full scale or limited ground operation uh, to, to basically address the last four battalions of Hamas uh, terrorists in that region. Well, you mentioned a million people hmm. take away 50,000. I'll let Mick Mulroy do the math, but the answer <laughs> is in the next coming days, how do you move that many people? I, I just I can't visualize it, Mick. Help me. Uh, so it will be difficult. I've seen some assessments it would take up to 12 days, but if you do your math, it doesn't seem to add up right now. Uh, but the other thing I'd point out is Israel doesn't have uh, to set an arbitrary timeline. They, their, their timeline could be if they elect to do their off offensive, and there's certainly some serious opposition to this, but if they're going to go ahead, they could base it off of when civilians are out of harm's way because it does look like they are voluntarily moving and some, uh, quite frankly, really quickly. Uh, so I hope that if they do go ahead, and that's obviously a choice that they're going to make, that they do allow all the civilians that they can get out to get out to a location where they can also receive humanitarian aid. It's obviously difficult uh, to, con uh, to convince people to move to a place where there's no food, uh, clean water, or the medicine they might need. So it is it is a very complicated situation uh, to your to point of your uh, first question, uh, but it needs to be done if this offensive is gonna take place. Mick, after the October 7 uh, attacks, uh, the Israeli government said their strategy was to uh, basically eradicate Hamas. We're seven plus months into this. It, I, I, is that even possible? I mean, we asked that question seven months ago. Is that possible? Seven months into it now, is that even possible? So that is a good question. You can never really eradicate a philosophy, which means people can join uh, Hamas or whatever comes after it. I think they should have been more specific and certainly given the IDF 
more reasonable objectives, which is to the military destruction of Hamas, which means obviously taking out the military leadership, depleting their their basically their their soldiers, if you will, yeah. the terrorists, uh, but also destroying the weapon systems that are so dangerous to Israel and these tunnels, which are a strategic problem uh, that most pe- most militaries have not faced to this scale in this type of operation. But if they could de- they could degrade those significantly, then I would think that would be a reasonable objective for the IDF. Destruction mm-hmm. of a philosophy, a terrorist organization. We've seen it when, with our efforts in 20 years. We have not done that. So uh, that is not likely to happen. And Mick, Peter Baker in the New York Times, and among many, many other headlines, including Bloomberg, the president of the United States puts arms shipment to Israel on hold. What does it actually mean? So if you look at the, the growing, I think, concern, but not just the White House, but even in the Pentagon, about how the war was being prosecuted, a lot of it has to do with use of use of large diameter bombs in urban areas. So 2,000 pound JDAMs uh, has a, a kill radius that is substantial. So even if you're targeting mil- militants in one particular block, you could be taken out two or three blocks. And I think that has been some of the major concern. Those are what the weapon systems I think that have been uh, uh, stopped from going to Israel right now because of this rough offensive. It may be in the future they condition it. You can use these weapons, but not in Gaza. I don't know if we're there yet. The quickest way to do that is simply stop those weapons from being uh, shipped to uh, to Israel right now, right before they're off. All right, Mick, just strictly from a military perspective, how do you think this pl- plays out? I mean, I, if your goal is to get every last Hamas fighter, you could argue no end in sight here. How do you think this plays out from a military perspective? Because the Israeli Defense Fund, they know what they're doing. Uh, they do. Absolutely true. But you're right. You're never going to get every Hamas fighter because every day there's new Hamas fighters. And as soon as you leave, mm-hmm. there'll be new. So I think it is really to go after their capability to wage uh, violence against Israel. So major weapon systems and every other weapon systems you can. The, the leadership, because leadership really matters. I mean, we can see that on October 7th, right. unfortunately. And these tunnels. These tunnels do give them a capability uh, that is unlike mm-hmm. most uh, terrorist organizations. So I think if you can degrade that to a point, and then you have to come up with a, a plan that is uh, attainable and sustainable when it comes to ceasefire. Because uh, everybody's right. talking about it now as this is what Israel needs to do. But the question is, as soon as they sign the agreement, how long is it going to take for Hamas to then violate that right. agreement? Because oh, their pur- yeah. purpose in life is to attack Israel. Mick, i got to squeeze this in. Your effort is my star in the sky about children forced into soldiering in Africa. This is something you've really led on worldwide. Just quickly here, how big is this issue? Well, thank you for bringing it up. It is a big and growing issue. In the last few years, it's doubled in uh, with the amount of children being forced to fight in the Middle East. The, the uh, uh, issue you're talking about is a documentary that me and my partner, Eric Ulrich, did on the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, it's being made into a book. It is made into a book, and it's kind of came out yesterday. Right. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that up because a portion of the proceeds – goes to our NGO uh, in child soldiering, which really yeah. addresses this issue, issue, not only to stop it, but to help rehabilitate right. uh, those children that have been forced to fight, and right. that needs to stop immediately. Mick, thank you. Mick Mulroy with us there on Gaza and what we see in Rafa. Mark Sullivan's All the Glimmering Stars uh, is uh, the book. Markets do better here. Off of futures, we're pretty moldy, but we've come back nicely. That's been the theme the last four, five, six days. Reminds me yeah. of the markets back in, I think it's 1975-ish. Oh, boy. We're celebrating Tony Tennille's birthday today. Really? We are? Okay. And, you know, we had Ace on and, you know, <laughs> what, the, what they're doing. And there was another woman of ability that came out of nowhere. And I was like, who is this person? It was like, literally, like, I, I remember this. She had a drummer. She picked him up. Sunset Boulevard. His name was Don Henley. And Not bad. Bass player. Yeah, you, you can play. Glenn Fry played. It was Ronstadt with a bunch of guys. Oh, yeah. Linda Ronstadt to get you out. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Radio.